Hello, everybody. It is Corey Poirier, and we are back live with the Blue Talks uh, Flip Your Script event. I'm here with my partner in crime, Elise Rothman. Uh, hello. Hello, hello. Uh, hello, hello. So nice to see you again. I honestly can say in between these, I always uh, miss uh, us doing this. Like, this is something I could easily... Uh, if my life wasn't like it is, see me doing every day of the week. So thank you for making it uh, it's so easy to do. I guess it's the best. Yeah. Just hop on any Flip Your Script Friday you want. I'll be happy to have you. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, let, let's try with that. Yeah, I really do enjoy this. And uh, I'm super stoked to talk uh, this week about mindset. Uh, we're fully kicking things off. And uh, we have a guest I'm going to bring up almost right away, only because I had a hiccup, as I least knows, at the office today, which threw things off. So means I'm sort of running behind the eight ball. Uh, but at least, can you tell us what's been going on, what's new in your world and in your life um, wow. just before we bring our guest on? Is that a trick question, Corey? <laughs> Okay. Wow, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. We have had um, quite a few Flip Your Script Fridays since the last event that we had. Amazing guests, always, always sharing new perspectives on how we can, now get this, linguistically reframe the way that we think. Because mindset, we all have a mindset, but how is our mindset? right? How can we reframe how our mind is set by the thoughts that we think and what we're really focusing on? And ultimately, you know what I've come to, dis to come to figure out, Corey? Really, everybody's looking for a sense of freedom. Yeah. Freedom. We want to feel freedom. I'm not talking about being able to vote and, and you know, move around and, and, and not wear masks or wear masks or anything. I'm talking about internal freedom, a sense of freedom. And so it's just been a great journey. Personally, I walk my talk and I love um, everything that's happening. As you know, I mentioned that we, my fiance and I just bought an incredible bespoke motel on the Wikiwachi um, Springs here in Florida, and we're going to open it up as a retreat space. So that's super exciting. And I'll keep you posted on that. Uh, tomorrow is an, another event that's an all day event that if you're not here, you can hop on the solopreneur event. We had Laura Lake as a guest, um, as a flipper script Friday guest as well. So it's the first annual of that. And things are just, you know, things are great. I recognize that we're all stars of our own show. And the plot might change. But who are we when we sit in in the seat, right, of, of, of where we are in the scene of our show. And so it's always good to recognize who we are, you know, regardless of what's going on around us. And this week, is going to be amazing. It is definitely um, seeds of success, seeds of perspective shifts will be planted. And I encourage everyone to like, share, and comment because these special guests and thought leaders are really going to help you flip your script in your own life. Well, at least what I want to, not now, but because uh, I want to bring on our guests, but I remind me at the end, at least, or tomorrow, I want to circle back to you and your fiance buying a hotel to turn into a retreat during COVID. Because, you know, people always have said to me, what, you know, why are you running, uh, launching your branded talks, which include the live event component right. during COVID? So I, that could be a, a good mindset question about flipping your script on something that in years gone past, maybe it would be easy to say, now's not the time. And, you know, I can say Blue Talks is enjoying probably more success. Mm -hmm. than it might have otherwise because of the fact that people are searching for answers. People are searching for hope. People are home right now uh, watching this stuff more than uh, more than normal. And uh, we all know there's there's downsides and there's negative stuff going on. And there's we all know there's challenges with something like COVID. But what I'm suggesting is, is that that wouldn't be a good reason for me to say, let's not do this and think of the lives that wouldn't have been impacted if we didn't. Exactly. And look, I mean, I've become a video cast host, a podcast host. I'm coaching. My coaching business is, is growing exponentially. See, it's either waiting or creating. And I think we need to talk. I would love to have a conversation about waiting or creating, right? We are here to create and we can use any excuse to wait. And I've, I, I, I have a question to pose at the beginning of this week. And who are you? Are you the same version of you that you were before this global plot twist? And what's showing up in your life right now? What's showing up in your life that's coming up? I promise you that it's you brought this to the global plot twist. Yeah, you got to wear a mask and there's certain things that are happening, but the things that are really showing up, I promise you brought here to this new, you know, scene. I call it the scene of the show. You're still the star. 
So my life really hasn't changed. I've, I've recognized more opportunities and I was, and I, and I've said yes far more than I have in the past, because listen, if not now, then when seriously, I mean, come on, if this is not a sign from the good old, you know, mother nature, giving us a little opportunity to start, you know, creating instead of waiting, what is? 100%. And that's a good segue uh, to bring our guest on because I think you guys are going to, your energy is going Hi. to be more together. Hello. So, Tara Kenzie Longacre, did I pronounce the last name correctly first? You of all? got it. Yeah. I, I wanted to double check and make sure. Uh, so, Tara, really excited to have you here today. And based on my. Hi, nice to meet you. Meet you. Yeah, I truly think you and Elise are going to really have a similar synergy based on my knowledge of the work that both of you do. And we uh, do have some comments on the side, but I'll leave those for a bit so we can let Tara kick things off. But Tara, where I'd like to start, and I think it's for Elise as well to get to know you a little bit better, is to get you to tell us just a little bit about who you are, your backstory, your journey, and who you are. <laughs> Well, and to even answer Elise's question, who are you? <laughs> who are you in this who global plot twist? <laughs> oh my God. And the, the waiting versus creating girl. Girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just got goosebumps. Can you see my hair? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so hello, my name is Tara. And a little bit about myself. So I work more with individuals one-to-one -one and in and, and group settings, but where we're connecting with spirit and more importantly, like your spirit and your true self. So that's, that's what I do and who I am when I work with people, because for me, I find it's very important to be able to have that connection of knowing that we are supported beyond measure, knowing that we're not here alone, like you're not alone. I'm not alone. We're really not alone, even though sometimes it feels frustrating. It feels confusing. It feels like we might be alone, but we are supported through each other and our connections, but then even going into powers that are greater than ourselves, whatever that is for you. Everybody's got their own idea or concept or belief about what that power is. And so for me, because I live through that, I live by that. Um, part of my mission, part of my purpose is to really share that with people as a reminder that we're not alone, that we are supported and to live fully, like seriously, fully where you feel content. You're not going to feel content all the time, but where you feel content to your core, where you're connected to your spirit, that's, that's my jam. And that's what I share with others. Was it always like that? No. <laughs> No, we're human. So we have highs and we have lows and we forget. We think we're here and we're doing it all on our own and we have to do it all on our own, which is really daunting and overwhelming <laughs> if you have to do everything on your own. And so I feel like when you start to understand that you can ask for help, you can ask for support, the people come. <laughs> And sometimes it's not people, the miracles come, the magic comes, whatever it is. And so just part. coming into that, seriously, it truly, because then you see it, you see it, you feel it, you experience it, and you know. So I don't know if that is what you asked, Corey. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. And okay. <laughs> I have to share this with you, Elise, uh, that I just saw Tara post it, uh, I believe it was yesterday. Um, a photo of her from her back when she was uh, oh. dancing. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't see that at least, but it was uh, it was pretty cool. And, and I guess that's a part Wait, of your back from story. where. I'll let back her share. In the but, day, so the day. this this is the interesting thing. Um, I feel like, and I'm sure many people can relate to having multiple lifetimes in this one life. It's like, oh my gosh, I, like check Girl, I all have the things. lifetimes in my body right now. There's yes! so many versions of me. I'm always like, who's showing up? What version of me is showing up in this scene right now? Well, right? And adapting, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Because I feel like with everything that's been happening globally, like adaptation is a thing <laughs> to not lose your sanity and to be able to just go within the flow of everything, adaptability. And so having different characters, having different representations of yourself. And I've had many, <laughs> many, many from wild to mild, like literally when I work with people and I say, I see you, I get you, there's no judgment here. 
Like I mean that from the deepest part of my heart because I have done many, many things and I, I get you. I'm there for you. Open, open territory, open ground for everything. So yes, I did do alternative performance art, we'll say. So Ooh. it wasn't quite burlesque. It wasn't quite being an exotic dancer, but it was, it was, you know, in between and fun and creative. And I loved it. Um, I'm just not doing it anymore in this moment, in this time. Maybe something that I'll revisit though, because it's been, it's been poking me and, and I can feel the fire coming again. So we'll see what I do with that. But in this it moment, made me in this think time, it made, it's funny <laughs> that you said fire. It made me think of Burning Man. So like performance Ooh. art and, so is that was that part of your past or maybe well, part of your future? Perhaps the future, like maybe that creative dance expression where more clothes stay on. There we go. That's what I'll say. Ooh, so you were experiencing <laughs> your authenticity and it's oh, girl. prime. I love it. Girl. It was great. I'm gonna go find that photo <laughs> and that post. You know that. <laughs> let's be Facebook friends. You'll see it. Yes, let's. I love it. So Sarah, I'd love to then, you said, one thing you said that I, I noticed that I'd like to unpack is you said it wasn't always this way. Mm. So can you elaborate on that? Like, was there a, I, I'm always curious with people when they have this moment. I had a cousin actually, my cousin's wife, which technically is still my cousin, I think. That's how it works. Cousin through marriage. She posted the other day a picture of the book, uh, what is it called? The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. Mm. And she said, who's read this book and who's had an awakening? And this is a person that I would have never in my whole life, ever, 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 with money bet on it, ever pictured using the word awakening. And yeah. so cool. Like I'm personally, uh, Eckhart Tolle, his books don't pull me in like they do others, but I'm all for anybody having an awakening no matter how they get there. But he, he, hearing her say that makes me wonder what the next 10 years is going to look like for her. So my question is, did you have an awakening or did you just have a moment or like, what was it for you that sort of changed that? Mm. You said it wasn't always this way. Corey, it's so funny that you're asking her that because I was thinking of what kind of creative questions could I ask? And it's almost like, I'm just going to say this, you were in the shower with me when I was thinking of it because you're asking the exact question. So I'm just going to sit here and let it all unfold, which is what I shared with you today. I'm like, let's see how this unfolds. Absolutely. 100%. Ah, I love when that happens. I think that that's, that is very relevant. You know, you can think something and it shows up and you never know how it's going to show up or who it's going to show up with. So... Absolutely. Yeah. Being so open. Ooh. Okay. So how did it happen? <laughs> um, so for awakening. So this is the interesting thing because a lot of the time, like with spiritual awakenings and things of that nature, like it can be different for many different people. We're all so different. However, for me, from a very young age, I've been connected to spirit. I've been communicating from spirit and it freaked me out to be quite honest when I was younger because you don't really have a language to wrap around it and so going into that it wasn't always like that so when I entered into more of like the mid to late teens I started drinking and doing drugs like we all do well not everyone but that kind of seems to be a phase that people go through um, however I found for me I really used that as a a source to numb <laughs> You know, so I wouldn't see things that because I, I wasn't crazy. I knew I wasn't crazy. Like I was aware of that connection to spirit and passed on people can be around and you can see them. Maybe not everybody can see them, but I knew that I could see them and feel things. And so I did work and use substances a lot to to numb that. And it worked great. Definitely worked great. I don't know if I'd recommend that as the option of, I don't want to be connected to the spiritual <laughs> gifts or happening. So maybe not a recommendation. But at the same time, I feel like it just got to a point where, where you know, like when you look at yourself and you're like, but this isn't really me. Like, who, who am I? That question, who am I? Who are you? And I, because parts of me, like I would have different characters or people that I would put forward and only people that I'd let really close would see Tara, would see me, would see the real me. And it got to a point where I didn't want to have to have the show, you know, like put on the show of, I have to be this way around these people. And I have to be that way around these people. And like, can't I just be myself? 
I'm myself, like I'm good enough as myself. And I think it got to the point where I actually was okay with me, like truly okay with me and who I was and what I thought and how I felt. And that was almost like the light bulb moment. Like you can still be wild and, and crazy and carefree, but at the end of the day, like really coming from a place where it's you choosing to be wild and carefree and not because you think or feel it has to be a different way. And so when I had that aha or that light bulb moment, everything started to shift. I started to allow myself to be open to spirit more, like interacting with spirit more, communicating with spirit more. And I love your word, unfolding, allowing things to unfold. So if I would find out information that maybe I didn't want to know, intuition was coming through, I didn't want to know, I wasn't going to force it. I wasn't going to ignore it. I was going to accept it for what it was and then kind of be grateful of, ooh, I've got an upper hat. <laughs> I know things. Maybe this could be awesome, even though mm -hmm. I don't like the information, you know? And so it was it coming to a point of being okay with me, regardless, like regardless of the past, regardless of where I was, but being okay. And then that's when everything shifted. It was I, a journey. Being <laughs> okay. That's like a key. When I work with clients, it's all, everything is holding them back from just being okay like what if you were okay right now like what if you just knew that you could be okay on your way to wherever it is that you think that you need to go to give yourself permission to be okay <laughs> so it's about finding that way that freedom of being okay on the way to finding out who you really are whatever that means <laughs> you know like so I love when you say that it's like okay like that's these two letters are like so powerful Seriously, just sprinkle okay all over everyone. Everything would be okay. <laughs> I, I love that, Elise, and I agree so much. Uh, one, uh, really quickly, I wanted to, um, since we're early in on the show, I wanted to let a couple of people say hi as well, and then I want to dive right back in, Tara. But um, also, uh, I should mention too, uh, as we're going through this, if people want to learn more about Blue Talks, because normally I'll say it off the top, but I didn't, you can just go to bluetalks.com. It's the easiest way. And on the website now, you can actually find the YouTube link so you can watch the speeches, Utah, uh, Blue Talk speeches. You can actually find the podcast link, the books, everything's right there. So that's where you're going to find it more about Blue Talks. And then we just had a few people that had checked in from the start, so I want to at least acknowledge them. So Kathy Elves Davis, and I'm, I might be pronouncing Kathy's middle name wrong there, uh, but I know Kathy. She's been a client. I've worked with her in the past. Uh, true rock star. She has a book called Miracles uh, about her journey, I believe, with breast cancer, and it's a very, very powerful book. And then we have Joanne Wenner, and she just says, perfect, we are here to create, which was a comment on Elise's mention about uh, to wait or create. Wait or create. And then Joanne also I promise says, if you've been waiting, you're still waiting. If you've been creating, you're still creating. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like all of a sudden. So it's just to become aware. 100%. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if you, do you know each other, uh, Tara, you and Joanne? I'm not sure. I'll say hello, though, Joanne. <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys do or not, so I wasn't sure. And then Maybe. Uh, this one here says, uh, I know who it's from only because I saw it on the page, Facebook page from Patricia. Patricia. Yeah, okay, Patricia McCorkle, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, she says, hey, and then Linda Marshall, I saw over on LinkedIn, said hello, uh, that we were airing live over there when I asked if we were live. Hey, Linda. There's Linda there. She says, hey, I'm here. So just wanted to acknowledge everybody uh, and thank everybody for checking us out. So Tara, you know, jump, to jump in from where we were and what Elise mentioned about being okay, mm. why do you, no, I'm just, I'm just going to pose this out to you. I'm sure we all have our opinions on this, but why do you think so many people struggle with being okay? Just being mm. okay with what is and just letting go. There's a great book called Letting Let Go or Letting Go that um, was in our mastermind group. And I think it's going to be a book coming up soon. And that it's all about the premise of being able to detach. But so many, I, I would say more people struggle with being able to detach than those that can do it. So why do you think we struggle with that? Is the big question I do. Well, and the interesting thing is, like it's the attachment, but that feels and when I work with people, this seems to be a thing that comes through a lot expectations and it's not even necessarily expectations that you put on yourself it can be but a lot of the time like there's a lot of external pressures from friends family lovers 
like the shoulds, like you're here, you should be doing that, like all of this pressure. And then sometimes that's even part of it. It's like, well, I, I can't do what I want to do because I'm going to let this person down or, or I'm supposed to be doing this or like, how can I even think that I can do that? Like there's, so it sometimes feels a lot more like external pressures. Some, but once again, internal, internally, like that doubting, the questioning, all of that can happen. But it feels like from what I've experienced and from working with other people, a lot of the, like, we'll use the word expectation a lot of pressure from the expectations of the way it's supposed to be, <laughs> you know? And it's uh, so interesting. Oh. oh, no, go ahead. I'll let you go. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to share a little. It's so interesting because, you know, these expectations are coming from someone else's perspectives. Somebody else's entire reality is different than yours, and they're taking their reality with their expectations, and you're now incorporating it and, ha and having it become your own. But it's a coming from a totally different reality because everyone's perspective is really truly their own reality. Mine changes minute to minute. If I shift a thought or flip my script, I have a whole new reality. It's really amazing. You can have like 10 realities in 10 minutes, you know? And so that's something to think about with this whole expectation coming from the outside from someone else is that their expectations are coming from their lens of perspective, which in turn is their reality. And so the question comes to be, does it resonate and is it truly my own? I mean, it's a place to start. Absolutely. I, I, I love that. And yeah, again, I, I feel like like myself, I know that I struggled with this early on is that you, as you said, you put outside pressures on, you listen to what other people's expectations are of you, all these things. And then at the end of the day, what I find most interesting is, you know, how they say, well, we worry about what that person's thinking of us. And then we find out at the end of the day, most people aren't thinking about this at all. So they're actually okay. And I'm not judging anybody. I'm not, I'm just generalizing, but people are okay saying, you should need to do this, you need to do that. But the truth is, when they're, after they're done telling us that, we carry that with us, but they don't carry that with them. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's just a relief. I find relief in the fact that somebody else's expectations really has nothing to do with my reality. So it's really all about me. I find the relief in that. Like, And then also, my expectations of someone else I can only change my, we can only change ourselves. So if I'm finding that I'm having an expectation of someone, I do it, I stop use my flip the script band and I come back and I say, wait a second, why is it that I need them to do this for me? Because they're not in charge of my happy and I'm not in charge of theirs. So, so true. And so, Tara, I guess that I'm also curious with the work that you do now, um, what do you find that clients say is the, uh, you know, I'll say for lack of a better way of saying it, the biggest difference they see or the I don't want to use the word transformation because it's such a big big word but you can use that if you want but what is the thing you find people say this is what's changed for me so a lot it's perception if we want to go with that perception and for them like that understanding because the way that we work together it's having them be open with their spirit and their soul and vulnerable with me and some of the things that we uncover or discover, whichever way you want to look at it, are things that they didn't necessarily know they were there, like consciously, mm -hmm. or there's feelings, like there's feelings that they've been having so intently. And then we bring through information <laughs> and poof, their mind is blown because they say, I knew it. I felt that. Oh my God. And so that helps to shift it for them of, you're not crazy. <laughs> You're not crazy. This is real. Or maybe these patterns that you've been experiencing that keep coming up for you in this life, it might not have anything to do with you in this life. It could be connected to your soul's journey. And so we can pull things and show them. And then it's that, that almost sigh of relief of that mm. knowing, that confirmation, that validation. So that's in the moment, but then even things start shifting in their life. Like with relationships, people are either coming back or falling off and disappearing, but they're in this space where it isn't gonna shake them as much as it would have before. So it's, yeah, that would be the biggest thing though, that confirmation, that validation. Confirmation's of, huge, right? That their gut was right. 
Like you help them confirm that they are really connected to their gut. And that's such a gift to be able to help somebody understand like, and have that connection with themselves. That's beautiful. Trusting. Like actually, because if it's coming from another, like an outside source where where it's like, oh my gosh, (gasps) I was right. I can feel that. It can build that trust. And then it almost gets you into that, that gauge or that barometer of your truth. Mm -hmm. So when you're getting feelings, when you're getting knowings, you, you almost can't ignore it. And so then that connects you into, okay, so this is the truth of where I'm at right now. This is the truth of how I feel. This is the truth of how I think and not having to judge it, just seeing it, calling it out for being truth. And then how do you want to operate? How do you want to work with it? Love it. And so uh, a couple other comments, Elise, uh, this is from Joanne as well. I love your flip the script hand movement, shifting body memory. Well, yeah, I got the band. They didn't see it. (laughs) But I have these flip your script bands that I'll make available to, which I probably should have done way at the beginning of this whole thing. But these bands are such great reminders, like just physical flip your script. Like, do I want to plant this thought, this perspective and this reality in my life right now? And if not, I must know what I would rather plant or what I would rather seed in my life. And so that movement is flipping. Flip it. Flip it. Right, and then another comment from Linda. Aww. Was, are you her daughter? No. <laughs> My daughter. I think they both probably know. I would think. But. Yeah. No, I'm I just kidding. Dead. I don't know. If maybe there was a connection we didn't know about. Soul but, uh, family. That's oh, probably a compliment. Soul daughter. I'm assuming she gets along with her daughter. So if she does, then that's, I'm assuming that's a great compliment. Um, so Tara, then you know where I'd like to, I guess, dive as well is. As far as and we talked about how you kind of had the shift for yourself and what that looked like, one of the things I like to ask people, because I like to give people practical tools they can take away, and sometimes those tools are in the form of what you teach people, but sometimes they're in the form of books that have changed your life or mm-hmm. podcasts or just resources. And so, first of all, I guess I'll go the book route first, but are you a reader? And if you are, uh, do you have a book or two that you always recommend to people when you start working with them? I can't say, oh, well, I can. One that's popping into my head right now. (laughs) I was like, what is that book going to be? I hope I do it justice, though. It's called Eastern Body, Western Mind. Eastern Body, Western Mind. Um, Judith and Dio. I can't pronounce it properly. I can see the cover. Pardon me. Um, And that really works more with the energetics in your chakra system. So if we want to look at that, these are energy vortexes that you have within your entire body. We have hundreds of them, but there's seven main ones that help you navigate and function in society. I wish people could read my mind. I can see the book. It's there. It's Eastern (laughs) Body, Western Mind by Andonia Judith or Judith Judith. Andonia. Wait, yeah. I'm gonna put it in. I'm gonna put it in the comments. Hold on. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm googling it right now. And it is a. I, I, it's a I wonderful it resource. Problem, so it may be oh. there. Are... Let's see. <laughs> well, you can put it in too, just in case. Uh, I'm sorry. What did you say? Oh, I said I put it in the comments too, as you were saying that. Oh, okay. You put it in as well. Um, um, well, there we go. As a, as a side note, back just a call back from a minute ago. She said, "My real daughter." As far as the daughter oh. comes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so just I guess to follow up what we said. So uh, so that book is uh, is one that um, obviously... Great resource, like for energetically, but if you want to look at like physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, it feels like an encyclopedia that you could use to function and operate in this world and reality that we live in. So I love it. I love it, love it, love it. Um, th- that is going to be the only book I'm going to say. That's now, how would, and yeah. Elise would probably compare that to, I know she feels a similar way about Louise Hayes. Uh, oh, a couple yeah. of Louise Hayes. Yeah. Well, I, that's the book that I, I've, I've, <laughs> I give it as gifts. I have every client purchase the book if they don't already have it. It's an incredible glossary just to recognize that our body really is sending us messages all the time. And what are the emotional probable causes and how can we flip our script you know, linguistically reframe the way that we're thinking about certain things and have the body then respond accordingly. So that, yeah, that is my jam. Louise, (laughs) hey, you can heal your life. You know, everybody should have it. Take anything you have in the medicine cabinet, get rid of it and put that book right there. That should be the first (laughs) go-to in my mind. 
And on that note, at least, and, and Tara, I do want to come back, remind me to come back to other resources. But um, one of the things I wanted to mention there is we talked about reframing a few times here. And at least would confirm that we talk about reframing every time we do this event. I would say probably most of the times that you do a Flip Your Script Friday, like yeah. reframing comes up a lot. And I'm a huge, huge fan of the power of reframing if it's done right. And mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a thing that the average person, and I say the average person, I mean somebody who's still skeptical, not ready for woo-woo yet, could still practice reframing. And I just feel like people don't realize how powerful it is because you don't even have to, depending on the reframing, you don't even have to fake it till you make it. You could literally oh. just reframe. Like I gave you an example. I know it resonated with a lot of people before and I won't go through the whole story, but at least you heard it before where I talked about my mother and I going through a drive through and a guy yelling at us from behind and my mother didn't hear him and we leave the drive through And I said, did you hear what that guy said? And she's like, what? And she's partially deaf, so she didn't hear him. And I said, oh, he was yelling at us and cursing at us. And she said, what? Turn this car around. I want to go back and have a talk to this guy. And then so I flipped the script on my mom and I said, yeah, but mom, it's Mother's Day. That's part of the day because I gave you the short version of the story. It's Mother's Day. Maybe he saw a mother and a son in the car and he's mad at us. Maybe his mother and him don't get along. Maybe his mother passed away. Maybe she's in the hospital. And without missing a beat, nothing had changed. My mother said, I never thought of it that way. We should go back and buy that little sweetheart a coffee. Mm -hmm. Reframing. <laughs> But nothing had to change. We didn't have to fake it at all. Just reframe the way you think about it. And it, what it made me think of when that happened was the Stephen Covey story about how a guy was on a bus and had these three kids running all around. And this is a true story, apparently. But Covey was writing and trying to work on his next book. And these kids were really being really noisy. And he said to the guy, is there any way you can settle your kids down? The guy said, oh, what? I'm so sorry. I wasn't really here. My, their, their mother just passed away. And I don't know how to tell them yet. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, when you hear that, do you feel differently about that guy that couldn't control his kids? Then you would have if you didn't know the mother passed away. Of course you do. But yes. there's no question there. And, it, and, again, here, and here's something that we can apply every day without even having to know the story. Like, so this is, so I always ask, I always ask my clients and I ask friends and whatever. I'm like, okay, so here's my question. Is there, a, is there something that without exception you believe? Without exception, like gravity, not like on when you go to church on Sunday or synagogue on Friday or, you know, when you're in a good mood, but without exception. And one of the things that I believe without exception is that we all do the best we can with where we are and what we know. Mm -hmm. And if you can take that and apply that in at your every moment of every day, no matter what you see on TV or who you run into, that everybody's doing the best they can with where they are and what they know, then we don't need to know if they just lost their parents or if the guy's pissed off because he sees a mother and a, and a son in the car. So to apply that is a huge game changer and what I would call a mind seed to plant in our lives right now because we are all doing the best we can. And when my best changes, so does my best. You know, and with, when what I know changes, so does my best. So I apply that to everyone all the time and it just brings it back to me. So if I'm having an issue or a challenge or a trouble, what is it that's in my cup that they're bringing out? Well, and to that point, what's the four agreements? There's the, the one of the agreements is about always do your best. And yeah. I'm not a big reader. I don't know. I have the book though somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> I, I usually know them and I usually forget one. Don't make Jeez, assumptions. I have those you know? two. I have those two. What does it say on there? Does it say it on there? They don't Let's have them all. Don't take things personally. Be impeccable with your words. Be impeccable with your words. Yes. And always be your best. The reason I brought that up, at least, is because of what you just said. What I love that Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote the book, says in there about that is he always says, don't and don't think that your best is always the same every day. You can only do the best that you have today. So when he says always or this be minute, Corey, right now, yeah. like in two minutes after we have this beautiful <laughs> woman, Tara, here, like people's perspectives can shift, you know, like. It's not even a day. It's like right now, every now, just make it the best now, right? The now, now, now. And life is a series mm -hmm. of nows. You focus on one great now and you keep having great nows, you're going to look at your life and be like, wow, that was wow. super easy. And there are all these awesome nows. Absolutely. And the only reason I even mentioned that with the four agreements is because when you mentioned my best is changing all the time, mm -hmm. I wanted people to realize that your best, like I say, could be different from day to day, even and minute to minute. It's not, it's not just a best that's like, this is my best this year because I learned new things. You know, what he's saying is that your bet, you're actually what now key thing here is he's saying your best actually tomorrow could be not as big as your best today. So this is, you You know more tomorrow, but what he's saying is you might've woke up crappy. You might've got no sleep because you have three kids and they beat on your head all night. Like he's saying that your best is even from day to day can fluctuate. 
So what you give today, you might not have as much to give tomorrow. And that's okay. But there's one thing yeah. is you can't unknow what you know. No, for sure. But that's, <laughs> but that's, what, you, that's what you know. It right? might not be your best tomorrow or in five minutes, but you <laughs> still can't unknow what you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's why when he says your best, for example, you got to remember too, it's a relative. Like your best could be cutting wood. So your mm -hmm. best cutting wood today could be like, that's still not maybe using your mind the same way, but mm -hmm. he's saying like your best, what if you're working at a store, you might not be able to give as much tomorrow as you could today, but don't beat yourself up. As long as you gave as much of that, what you have to give on that day, you gave as much of that as you could. So I just wanted to clarify that or add that. I should say not even clarify for yeah, people. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> and so Tara, uh, so that we don't, uh, you know, that we get you back in here for a minute or two uh, <laughs> before we have to start winding down. And we're all like chatty. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, um, well, I, I asked you about books. Are you a uh, podcast listener? Do you watch video? Are there any other resources that you would give people normally? Or people, And obviously I understand that the most important resource is you and they <laughs> should go with you and we'll talk about how they can do that and why they should do that. But I guess I'm wondering as well, is there any other place you send people? Just because I'm a big fan of when people say, you need to check out this podcast or this book because it gives me resources to work with. So one main resource, and it's it's a practice more than anything than a book or a podcast, it's being able to bring your consciousness and your awareness into your heart. Mm, I because I know like this is about flipping your script and at the same time, like how your thoughts are very impactful, so are the feelings. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the feelings can take precedent for what you're thinking. And so if things get really loud and confusing in the mind, taking some moments to just, you know what, I need a break, either putting your hands on your heart physically to mm -hmm. bring that physical body sensation of being here. And setting the intention of, okay, so I'm going to go into my heart space. I'm going to breathe in here. I'm going to bring the questions, all the chaos that might be going on in here, but I'm going to bring it here and see how that sits and see how that feels and see how I feel. And so that, like out of all of the resources that I ever really instill or offer to people is getting them to think can we call it think with the heart think and feel absolutely with i think the heart. heart is the heart is the brain actually the right? heart is the brain child you know well and so, this creates yes. so much confusion like this like talk about those external everything coming in here like when you go into your heart it actually gets a little bit quieter it gets there's more stillness Mm -hmm. There can still be chaos, but when you're here, like once again, talking about truth, when you're here, this will help you sift through any questions, any concerns, any thoughts, any feelings that you have. This will help you sift through that and determine where you want to be, how you want to feel, and how you can just be. Oh, how mm -hmm. you can be okay. Ah, there you go. <laughs> how you can be okay. How you can be okay. So that is my biggest resource to offer people of bringing your consciousness and your awareness into your heart and breathing in there and allowing yourself to feel whatever it is you need to feel. It might not even be anything. You might not feel anything and be okay with that. But creating an intention to go there more, if it's loud, if it's confusing, or if you really just want peace. Mm. Yeah, I was just listening to Greg Braden, who talks a lot about like ancient shamanic Aborigine practices, right? Spiritual practices. And one of the practices, one of the meditations he speaks of is just putting the hand and bringing all the attention mm -hmm. to the heart and how we have so many, um, how the heart actually plays a larger role than our brain from a scientific standpoint. So once again, I was just listening to a Greg Braden podcast or one of his, I don't know, hour long things. And he would talked exactly about bringing your hand to your heart mm -hmm. and you can feel the difference. If everybody just put your hand to your heart right now, who's listening and you could, your awareness is going to go to where your hand is, where that, where that connection is made. That's so, and it's so easy, right, girl? I mean, hello, in the middle of everything, just put your hand on, if all is, all is just going awry, awry, just stick your hand on your heart. And that's the thing. Sometimes it doesn't feel easy though, but like, if you like physically putting your hands there, if that helps you get you there, do whatever is going to work, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there, it's a, there's a great quote, and I'm going to give her credit for it, but I, I think I've heard it outside of her, and I think long before I met her, so she said it to me, but I, I think she was maybe quoting somebody else. But Lisa Nichols, during a past interview, said, uh, attention goes where energy flows. Mm -hmm. Energy flows, oh, sorry, energy flows oh, where, where attention, attention, goes. attention goes. And so when you guys just mentioned that, at least, like, your attention is going to go, or your energy is going to flow there because that's where you're putting your attention immediately. And I just think it's such a, a powerful thing that we forget that on a regular basis. And it's simple. And sometimes we think that simple is invalid. But sometimes yeah. simple, just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy, like you said. You know, simple's not always mm -hmm. easy, but simple is profound and powerful. Well, to that point, I mean, how, this is how I view it. It's like I said about the uh, reframing and the saying that to my mother. I mean, it's easy to say that, but if you're in the car by yourself alone and somebody throws it the middle finger, it doesn't mean it's easy to take a breath and think about how you're going to react. I'm not saying that's going to be easy to say, okay, right. I have to respond a certain way. And much the same way, we can say it's easy, but is it really easy for the average person to stop when they're having a really rough time and go, I'm going to put my hand on my heart and feel it. But it's powerful. Not easy, it's simple, but it's easy. simple. Right. It's yeah. something you can do simply and you can make it happen. But the hard part, I think, is doing it consistently. Remember to well, do it when running into those scenarios. That intention, though, that everybody is doing their best in every moment with what they have, like if that's your baseline and your understanding. And where they are and what they are knowing right now. Yeah, exactly. And so even if they cut you off and they give you the finger and like shake their fist, it's like, whoa, I wonder like what side of the bed they got off on. Or right. And maybe their wife's having a baby or like who knows what's going on. I'm always like, you just don't know where they're going to. And sometimes I'm not paying attention and I do the same thing. And it wasn't like I meant to piss someone no. off. Right. Like we all are human and we're doing well, what we can. Well, and I'm is it worth your energy though? Like what, like really, is it worth your energy and your time and your attention no. to, to focus on, on something that like might not even really be a thing, you know, well, it's probably not even really a thing. The, yeah. the thing is between the, our, the thing lies between our ears. That's yes. where the, the thing lies. So, at least because you met him at the, our Blue Talk San Diego event, the film, the guy who was filming, I won't say his name, but you, if you remember who did the, the camera work, mm -hmm. he, him and his, his wife, what they do is when somebody cuts them off, they always say, Oh, they probably just need the bathroom really bad. And they got to get there. And <laughs> Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, that's all it takes. Here's a different word than use the bathroom. But, oh. but my point is, is that I get laughing. I get them getting it immediately. Uh, one of the other things I want to say that I think would be powerful for people to visualize, we put this up in our in our home. Uh, we haven't actually put it up in the new home yet, but we had it in our, it was the first thing I saw every day when I walked in. My girlfriend put it together. And actually where we heard it was through, I'll give her a bit of a shout out, um, Teal Swan. And it was actually from an interview I did with her at the Hayes conference that we were at, at least. And so what she said was, and she probably put this in her book. She probably said it other places, but what would somebody who loved themselves do? Mm. And so what I do is I think of that all the time when I'm making decisions. And, you know, and I say to people like uh, my girlfriend who quit smoking a year ago, that's one of the things she kept saying to herself. If I love myself, what I keep smoking whenever my son's saying, you going for a puff puff, mom? You know, but it's it's a constant reminder. What would somebody who loves themselves do? And so, and but also, I think it comes to how do you talk to yourself? Your self talk. Mm. Would you talk to yourself that way? And the truth is, I think you do probably love yourself, but I, you know what I mean. Like we don't we don't feel that way, and we have all these other layers. But if you would truly ask, what would I do if I loved myself? You would probably react different than you do sometimes. And the other thing Teal said, which I love, is you can't hold somebody else's hand without your hand being held. Mm -hmm. Yes. And those two things, I mean, they're powerful. I carry them with me all the time. I had a person in an interview one time, his name is Matt Whitman, and he gave somebody else credit, but I don't remember who the name was. Uh, he said, um, what do you say? Um, you, it's along the lines of, if you want more love, give more love. Hmm. He said, if you want more hugs, give more hugs. But you can use that with anything. If you want more love, give more love. If you want more hate, give more hate. I mean, the truth is, as we said, uh, uh, the energy flows where the attention goes. So I just want to add those things in that, um, to this point, if people want strategies, think about it. What would somebody who loves themselves do? And put that on a sticky and ask yourself when you're mm. about to make a decision and beat yourself up, would you do that if you loved yourself? Well, First and one. even one one motto that I had is, is this coming from a place of love? So exactly the same thing, just different words. Like, is this 
truly coming from a place of love for how you feel, how you're treating other people, different choices for situations. Mm -hmm. very, and, if, very and if it's not, I use the cup, the cup analogy, like if you have a cup of water and you knock it over, water's going to come out. If you have a glass mm -hmm. of wine and you want knock the glass over, the wine's going to come out. So any situation that's a, I would call an adverse situation for whoever's mm -hmm. in that experience, whatever's coming up was already in your cup. So thank the situation, thank the person and figure out what, why was it, why is this still in my cup? You know, and why, and, and, and how can I like get it out of my cup and fill my cup with something else? So when I get knocked over with a global plot twist or somebody cutting me off or telling me I need to wear a mask or whatever it is, what's coming up? And it's get eyes on your own paper. That's like my step. I have three steps and step number one is eyes on my own paper, eyes on your own paper. And that, and that was like the the smartest thing we were ever taught in school. And that, and really it's like, how am I responding to the world that I've been really a co-creator in mm -hmm. and what, what's in my cup and what's coming out? And you just said it too, Corey, is like, where are you spending your precious, or you, I think you said it, where are you spending your precious valuable energy? Is it worth mm -hmm. my priceless valuable energy to, 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 to fuel it, to fertilize it, to cultivate whatever that is? And if the answer is no, you make some pretty clear choices based on eyes on your own paper and where am I spending my energy? Mm -hmm. And then you can start this process of really making choices to support the grandest version of us because then we get to be the best for everyone else that we meet. You know, so if it's not for you, do it for everyone else. If you need a reason, <laughs> absolutely, do it for everybody else. <laughs> absolutely, so you figure out you're worth it. Well, yeah. it's the thing. I mean, it's a weird scenario, but I, I always wondered why in customer service, people, you know, like they they uh, yell at other, like they yell at customers, they curse or fight with them, they treat customers poorly, and I'm like, your day would be so much easier. Like even if you're selfish about it. Your day would be better and easier. You wouldn't have the manager complaining because the customers are complaining about you. You wouldn't have to deal with unhappy customers because you're treating them nice and you're smiling. Like, I don't understand the logic because even if you want to be selfish, you still think you would. it would be a better day if you treated customers well, even if it was for selfish reasons. Well, well then you go home. Like, you right. go home and take your crappy day home, too. But like that don't recognize that they deserve to be okay mm. or feel happy. Like, so there's a whole... True. There's yeah. a whole bunch of stuff going, and you know that probably better than anyone else, Tara. Like, there's a yeah. lot of stuff going on in us, <laughs> in us beings. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Tara, um, one thing I want to ask you—I promise that we go here—is what does it look like for people to work with you? And of course, a big question is how can they connect with you to start that process? Like, if they want to reach out, because what will happen a lot of times after this is people will come on and say to me, "How do I reach Tara?" So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm giving you the opportunity to say that because we had. Uh, Catherine Roy, if you remember, at least from a bunch of times ago, we had Catherine Roy on, and mm -hmm. I had people reaching out to me like crazy. She's like the LinkedIn ninja. Yeah, because oh. I forgot they had a reacher, and she ended up actually working with a lot of clients from the call, from the call. Mm -hmm. But they were me, and I had to connect them with her because uh, we didn't give her, give her time to say. I think I don't know if that was the reason, but I just know that they were coming to me saying, "How do I get a hold of Catherine?" So Tara, I want to give you the floor to tell us how we can learn All more All right. You. So my company, um, this might not be a surprise, is Heart <laughs> to Heart Journey. <laughs> so really about making heart to heart connections as we go through the journey of life, whatever it is. Um, and so I, I work in many different facets with people. I do one-on-one -on -one work, which involves intuitive readings. So accessing their Akashic records for soul readings. Mm -hmm. I do group activities. I teach classes where people can learn how to connect with their own personal soul wisdom. I'll be your loophole, but you can also do it on your own. So I really like to, to share those skills and tools so people have their own you know, they can feel empowered. They can go into their soul's records and find out anything and everything that they'd like to. Um, so yes, I do one-on-one -on -one sessions and I do offer other options where it can be extended. So we kind of cover different areas of topics over a couple sessions. Um, so really there's anything and everything to explore. My website is www.heart to heart journey, but it's the number two. <laughs> dot com so that's where they can find me i'm on facebook and instagram um under heart to heart journey as well and i do lots of like free intuitive reading posts so if you want to find out what do i need to know right now that you can pick a card and you'll get a message or i do videos 
um, weekly that are more specific to your astrological elements and and things of that. So I really do like to play and interact um, with people on social media so they can pick the card, they can ask the question and receive their own message. And I'm just the vessel that brings it forth for them. So that's I where you can that. find me. And yeah. I'm on your website right now and you actually have oh. an event page. So I see that there's oh, events do. you do have coming up, right? I mean, they're yeah. listed here. So if they go to your site, there's a link that says events. So yes. you can see what events Tara has coming up. And I well. do online and in person. So in the moment mm -hmm. I'm located in Calgary. Oh gosh. And I work a lot with sound healing. So we do sound healing meditations um, and a lot online. So, and I, to be quite honest, I love, I love the abilities that online offers because you can talk to anybody anywhere in the world and work with anybody anywhere. In like the I'm world. in Florida so right now, girls. So yeah. With me, so. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> exactly. And you're welcome to come. I, I mentioned before you got on that we just bought this bespoke motel on this incredible canal filled with manatees and and florida springs and we're going to create this beautiful retreat space to be outdoors ah. and be able to honor the climate of the world right now but also to have this and it is very sacred space as well i did want to mention tara as well when we're finished here you can mm. feel free to go into the comments and put all your links in the comments oh, so if somebody okay. comes back and watches the um the replay your information will be in the comments below Oh, so beautiful. It's something oh, you can do. Because this will go away. So or right there. Away. <laughs> right. But this will go away. But if you yeah. put it in there, then when people scroll, they can see it and it'll stay there. Oh, I love it. Wonderful. Awesome. And, and thank so, you, Corey. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Tara. <laughs> and uh, I was going to say, too, one thing I should do. If you Do you know who Emily Harrison is? No. I know. Okay. She, you remind me of Emily, actually. No. Like oh, I get the same vibe <laughs> from you guys. <laughs> yeah, I should connect you guys. That's why I asked. She uh, is the founder of the Akeshic Academy and Akeshic Record Ooh, Magazine. And so okay. remind me to connect you after after the fact. I'll connect you to her. Please. And I just somebody else she's connected with who does Akeshic Records named Laura uh, Knapp Mazota, who's actually going to be speaking at our Blue Talks Columbia event with Emily. So, oh, um, awesome. Yeah, so we'll circle back. But I just I, I put it out there so that you remind me to make sure to connect okay. you. Okay. Awesome. Wait, is that the one that's coming in the spring? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be there too. I know. I was thinking that as I said. Oh my it. god! It's going to be the trifecta. Yeah, and and there's two days, so for people will get to learn about Akashic Records. But I'll make sure I have you face there, so it's not Akashic Records all together. But I can't imagine the energy you guys are going to bring to New York at that time. So, oh awesome. my god, that's exciting! Cool. Yeah. So make sure I connect you with her. Keep me honest Please. on that. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks, Tara. It's been an absolute pleasure. We'll let you Thank run for you. now. Uh, we'll just call it a for now and a call it a two. Yes. And bring you so back in the future. meeting you. So Bye, nice love. You as well. Ciao. So Bye. You. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. And Corey, I, I, that was awesome. I thought you would I thought you would really enjoy that. I actually I thought it would be really a great interview. Thank you for thinking of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't take much time because we want to bring our next guest on right away. But I only want to say one quick thing. Sure. That um, that came to my mind whenever I was talking about reframing because um, I saw I like, got a couple people private message me about reframing, saying thank you for mentioning that because that's something I feel I could do. And one of the things that was very powerful for me is I went to see Tony Robbins at a learning annex type conference, and what he did he did something there because he's big on you mentioned. Uh, uh, neuro linguistic programming, and mm -hmm. he was really big on that. I mean, some people think he created it. He openly gives credit to Richard Bandler and the other guy who created it, but he studied under Richard. And Tony sh shared this exercise. And as a salesperson, I was like, "Why have I not been doing this all my sales career?" But it's also something we can all do in our life. And so okay. what he said was, he said, "What I want you to do is turn to the person next to you. Uh, let's say to your right, and I let's want turn you to, to each other. Let's see how do we do that." Go ahead. Uh, I, yeah, you'd have to have a second person with you right now because they have. Well, to you are my second person, Corey. <laughs> yeah, so funny, but if we turn that way, we won't see each other. So what he said was, uh, turn to the person to whatever side and sell them a pen. And what I want you to do, is, and whether you had a pen or not, but most people did. But I want you to sell that pen. But mm -hmm. as you're selling it, I want you to visualize the worst event that's ever happened in your life. So in other words, I want you to get in the mind frame of. If you lost a child, if you were in a car accident, uh, if you lost your parent when you were young, what have you. And I want you to get in that energy space, and then I want you to sell that pen. 
And then what I want you to do is yeah. turn the other side. And I want you to think about the best day of your life, marriage, birth of your child, whatever that is. And then I want you to sell the pen. And what he wanted the other person to do that you're selling the pen to is to describe what your body did. And so the, the worst day of your life, your body was slumped. You were talking lower. You were pushed back and you were, you were low energy, negative energy. And then the best day of your life, your, your chest was out and you were up and you were speaking loud. And basically what he's trying to do is show us how we can change our behavior, our mindset. And then what I did was I started doing that before every sales call. Because when you go in sales calls, you're always getting rejected. So it's always a negative. So I start going into sales calls. Before I walk through the door, I would uh -huh. say, save my life. And when I would visualize whatever that was. You would not believe the difference in my sales results. But my point of this is we can all do that. It doesn't have to be about sales. Think about when you go into the office every day. Why not say to yourself, put my, my mind frame in the best day of my life. And by the way, that's what he did to help Andre Agassi finish his career on a high. Because Andre Agassi, the tennis player, was on a slump. And he went to Tony Robbins. And Tony said, I want you to do this. I want, you, I want to get you in. I mean, he has a unique way of doing it. But I want to get you in the space of what you felt like and what you were thinking when you were winning in Wimbledon. And he brought him back to that face so that that way, anytime he was hitting the ball, he could immediately put himself into the right mind space. And it worked. The guy, I mean, the guy, I think he won Wimbledon at the end or he came close after having a big slump. And But all he did was he said, I want to trigger you. I want you to think about best day of your life. And my point is, we can all do that. We can well, all listen, we all have memories. It just seems, it seems to be more common. I'm just going to say it seems to be more common that we evoke memories that bring low frequency. Because if you can evoke some traumatic moment and still blame your mom or your dad or your teacher or your best friend who dissed you or stole your boyfriend or whatever it is, the stories that we bring up that cause this anxiety, this depression, this physical chronic illness, we can also bring up the memories that make us feel great and excited, like before we go on a trip or when we're really excited and inspired about something. We can bring up either one. I mean, there's, they're all accessible. So what is the choice that we're making and why? Absolutely. So there's so many things we can do. The question is sometimes is to go inward for me and with my clients. It's like, okay, so, so hold on a second. I get what you're saying. However, what if this, this that you, that's holding you hostage from your ultimate freedom, I call it. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about freedom, freedom to be okay right now without having to have something happen. Right. Without because the only reason we want something to happen or we think that we need it to happen is because then we're going to finally give ourselves permission to feel OK for the moment, because it's like not sustainable, because then now the next thing has to happen for us to give ourselves permission to feel better or be happy or whatever it is. So what is it that's holding somebody from choosing to bring up that memory as opposed to because because it's available and it's in our our records right now, right in our subconscious memory, in our hard drive. So it, it's available. But the question, I think, the first step is, what's what is it? What is it that could be holding me from making that choice instead? Because it's available. I know I should be drinking eight glasses of water, and I'm excited when I drink a glass and a half. I'm like, yes, you know, I I almost drank two glasses today. Like I know that I'd feel better. Right, that it's better for me if I do. It's available, and how easy it's to drink. You know, if I finish this glass in the in the two hours that we're here, I'm going to be like, yes, yeah, celebrate. <laughs> but so it, it's there. But what's holding us back? Like that's that's one of the questions. Like, what is it? Like, what could be holding yeah. me from making that choice? Well, I'm going to play on that what could be theme as a segue to bring on our next guest. Okay. <laughs> so there, there's no specific reason why I said that's going to be the segue. I just said what could be. And we're going to find it. What could be any second now? So, okay. Maggie Slider. Hey. Hello, hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. I think I might be echoing on your side. Are you? Do you maybe have a echo? On? I'm hearing a little oh, echo on your side. Yeah. Do you maybe have us on a computer? No, nope, you're on my uh, my phone because my computer died. Okay. <laughs> so I have no computer. You're just on my phone. All right, so there's a bit of a mechanism, but we'll, we'll work through it. Okay, it could be because I live in the country and I don't have really great Wi-Fi, so I'm using my data, but uh, it's the best I can do. <laughs> we'll make it work. Okay. So, at least did you want to jump in and, and uh, introduce yourself to Meg? And... Oh. Did you hear me okay? 
Yeah. I'm feeling, so, I'm hearing some static and I'm not sure if it has to do with Maggie because it shouldn't affect us. Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm uh, not hearing any static. So she's turning us back here. So let me, let me try to I'm going to move myself up and see if you hear staff. Okay, we'll just chat for a sec. Hello? Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. I have no idea who you are. <laughs> well, I just know who you are because I got your little bio. <laughs> and I did some research. I think I'm still staticky too. I'm uh, static on my end. I'm good on my end. Listen, so we'll just leave her on by herself. We'll hop up. <laughs> My name's Elise Rothman, and I'm working with Corey to create this virtual stage. And I'm the founder of Flip Your Script Coaching and what I call a mindset architect. So I help people reframe the way that they're thinking um, and using the thought, emotion, and feeling to help them recognize, release, and restore whatever's holding them back. So I'm blessed to have the opportunity. Corey and I, God, Corey, I was just talking about the Hay House event that we met at. Was that five years ago, six years ago? At least. Was it the year that Wayne Dyer transitioned? It was. So whenever that was, that was that year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we met and I had the honors of speaking at Blue Talks out in San Diego and we came up with this virtual event thing when we needed to pivot because of the plot twist and uh, been blessed to be able to, you know, have Flip Your Script Fridays and meet amazing people like yourself, mostly from Canada. Who knew there were so many amazing people in Canada? I get a one-on-one -on -one experience with all of you. Yeah. So it's great to meet you. Nice awesome. to meet you as well, and I'm excited to learn more about what you do and who you are. So I figured out how I can help with the static. If I, if I, I'll try it right now. Do you want me to try to hop off? No. So if, so what, uh, Maggie? I know you can still hear me. So if I mute your side when I'm talking, it gets rid of the static. And so, but then I think when you're talking, we don't have the static. So I'm going to ask you the question, and I'm just going to watch for when you're answering, and then I'm going to flip it over. Should a bit. I mute myself? Uh, we can try that, but I think, I mean, we're okay right now. Yeah, that's what I mean. So let, we'll just go this way and we'll wing it. Uh, but this way we keep the static off for other people. So Maggie, I guess let's start this way. Can you tell us a little bit about your backstory and your journey, just so people get a feel for who you are as we kind of dive into things? Sure. Um, okay. So this goes back quite a few years ago. Um, I have to keep my glasses on as well, otherwise I can't see you. So and I, I hate how I look in my glasses, but it is what it is. Um, so it goes back quite a few years ago. I was in a very unhappy marriage. Well, actually, it wasn't even an unhappy marriage. I was very unhappy. I was feeling like I was drowning, like I was suffocating. And one day my husband left for work. We just moved to a new location in a big house that I didn't really want. But we just moved. We had adopted two kids because I couldn't have my own kids. Another long story. And um, my husband was leaving one morning to go to work. And I had this thought in my head about, is this it? Is this my life? I'm married. I've got two kids and a dog. I'm living in this kind of upper middle class um, neighborhood with really snotty neighbors. And I just felt like I, I'm not really supposed to be here. I, don't, I, I just, I don't even know how to explain it, but I just felt like somebody had kind of planted me there, but it wasn't really me and I really shouldn't have been there. And this big, like, is this it for me was like a, a light bulb that went off because I knew that something was really missing. So from that moment, I started having, I heard you asking the last, um, the last lady that was on Tara, I think her name was, some questions and I'm thinking, oh, she could answer those questions for me too. Um, but I ended up, so I'll, I'll go through the, the story really quickly. I ended up leaving my marriage for a bunch of different reasons, but I ended up leaving my marriage and I ended up, um, I got myself a full-time job because when I left my marriage, I had no money. I'd been a stay-at-home mom. So I had to really quickly find some money. I did a job in a, in a group home overnight for six months to make some money. It wasn't easy, but I did it. And then I got a job with the school board working in the special needs classroom, which I absolutely loved working with those kids. And then I thought, okay, good. I'm in a better place now. I'm happy. I've got my kids with me most of the time. I've got another house. I've got a job. It's good. And then I started asking the universe, 
and I don't even know where this came from, but started asking the universe for some guidance and help. I need a mentor. I need somebody to guide me. Um, but I didn't even really know what I was asking for. I just had always felt like a part of me was missing, but I had no idea what that part was. And then fast forward another, but another year and a half, um, I entered into a major depression. Um, could barely get myself out of bed every day. And I had been depressed before when I went on antidepressants, but this was even worse. Um, so I've lived with depression most of my life, but usually I can manage it. And um, this time I couldn't manage it. I would get up in the morning, take my kids to school and my PJs, go home and go back to bed and get back up half an hour before I had to go pick them up. I would get dressed, go pick them up, and then I would make everything look like mummy was doing well, mummy was functioning really well, till the kids went to bed, and then it kind of started all over again. And that lasted for quite a while. And then um, I lost my job, the job that I'd been in like for three year, two, two or three years, I lost that job. So then I was worried about where am I gonna get income now? And then a couple of months after that, my husband, who I was still married to, we were separated, but we were still married. My husband passed away um, suddenly. So there was police officers at my door, knocking the door to tell me that he had passed away. So at that moment, it was like, how do you turn around and tell your kids that their dad's not coming home anymore? And it was um, Boxing Day. So it was like the day after Christmas. And um, it was just such a really... I felt like I was being punked. It just felt like this can't be happening. After, I mean, I'd, I'd almost died 20 years ago. I'm actually a medical phenomenon three times over. I had infertility. I had a whole bunch of stuff, and I won't go into it, but a whole bunch of, I'm a real trauma survivor in so many different ways, but um, that's not what I focus on. And then um, that was on Boxing Day 2012, and then January 12th, I was still in my major depression. I was trying to figure out how to end my life. Um, and the only way that I could do it without my kids finding me. And then my husband, when my husband passed away, I thought, well, I, I can't end my life because then what will happen to my kids? So his death was actually a blessing in disguise in a really weird way. And then January 12th, I was still in this real funk. I pulled my back out really couldn't move, couldn't sit, couldn't stand, couldn't, but I had to get my kids to school. So I got them to school. When I came home, I got myself onto the floor and I bawled my eyes out, literally just bawled my eyes out. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I just, I, I give up. I give in. I just, I was so wounded that I just can't do this anymore. And I cried for about 15 minutes. And all of a sudden I heard, uh, that's enough. Get up like someone was standing right beside me and i was like okay and from that moment i got up i grabbed my journal and i wrote in my journal that day um you know today is going to be like any other day and then it was like a little light switch went off and it was like hell no no it's not enough is enough this is the day that i change and that was my pivotal moment that was my moment where I knew that I had to take responsibility for where I was. I knew that I had to um, reach out to somebody and ask for help because I was doing this all alone. Nobody, most of my friends never knew I was going through this. Everybody thinks it's Maggie, Maggie's, Maggie's always good, um, but I wasn't. And uh, so that was the pivotal moment. And from that moment, when I was asking the universe and asking God for help, I ended up, um, you mentioned Lisa Nichols and this woman, I don't know if you know this woman, Christy Whitman, uh, who is a good friend of uh, Lisa Nichols. Christy Whitman runs the um, Law of Attraction Quantum Success Coaching Academy. And so I ended up with a, um, an email from a guy called Rich, Richard Luck from Australia, just out of the blue. Um, and a friend of mine who's a clairvoyant medium had actually said to me, you're going to get an email in the middle of the night. It's going to be like an email from God. And it's going to be what you end up doing for the rest of your life. Two nights later, I got this email from Richard Luck saying, I'm, a, I'm doing a pilot project for Christy Whitman's um, Quantum Success Coaching Academy. And I'm looking for five people to come on as students free of charge. And I'm going to help you set up your business. And I ended up, I had to sign up for Christie's course, which ironically, I had just gotten through Facebook the day before. 
So it was kind of like, ha, huh, this is kind of weird. So things just, because I'd opened myself up to the universe, things just started um, fo following my path. And I just started, um, and I was terrified, outrightly terrified, because my husband was a very, very skeptical man and would always tell me I'm making the wrong decision. And so I always felt like I was being controlled. So this was really terrifying for me, for me to actually join um, a course and me to actually pay money for that course and me to actually feel and believe in myself and think that I could do this. And um, I did it. I joined Christie's class. I worked with Richard for a while. Um, I joined Christie's class. Um, I graduated a year later and um, I started my coaching business. And now I've been coaching on and off because I've been doing other things too. But I started my coaching business and I don't even like to call myself a coach because I've grown so much in the last five years. So now I call myself an intuitive guide because I realize now that I have spiritual gifts, which were why I was feeling that something was missing and I wasn't really being me. Um, so I've realized who I am and why I was and, and uh, really trusting. I've learned to trust myself. I've learned to trust the universe. I've learned that when you're really in alignment and you're open, the universe will bring the right things and opportunity in your path. And uh -huh. that's kind of why I'm here today. So, wow. So, a couple of uh, thoughts there. Um, I mean, I love the uh, the idea that the universe was guiding you, and you got the call or email that was like the email from God. I think that's so powerful. And um, you know, Elise, uh, I'll ask you before I, I jump in with questions for Maggie, but uh, you listened to that story as well. Do you have any questions that jumped out at you, the burning questions you want to ask? Well, I, did, I wanted, I heard you use the word, it was so weird. And I hear that word used a lot. And I just wanted to give you um, the definition of weird, suggesting something that's supernatural or uncanny. So we use, oh, that was weird. Yeah, that's like supernatural. That's like, you know, what miracles are made of, you know, like when the weird stuff shows up, that's really when we're in this vortex, when we're so connected, it's when that supernatural uncanny coincidences, as we might call them, show up. So when you were telling the story and you were getting into alignment, as I call it, right, and connecting with the version of you that you just were a little disconnected from, and that's why it felt so crappy for so long, <laughs> like, you weren't, you didn't find anything. You just got reconnected with that version of yourself. Then the weird stuff, that supernatural stuff starts showing up. So I love, I mean, that was what I took of this. And I just, I love, I love hearing stories like that because it's like, yes, that's it. Like, that's the best part. That's like the juiciest part is like getting into alignment with where the good stuff's at and watching it show up and recognizing these weird miracles that just show up in the middle of the night in an email. And saying and starting to create as opposed to wait, right? You start creating with these weird moments that show up as opposed to wait. You know, maybe I'll respond later. Well, then you wouldn't have been in the top five. So I love it. And so, Maggie, let me uh, dive in a little bit. So I love that you shared with us because I said earlier today, I love finding out when people had that kind of, for lack of a better word, we'll say awakening or that moment, that shift, whatever that looks like. And so I'd love to get your take on after you had this big shift in your life, what is, because people always ask me, what was it like for me before? And I know you shared the before I found my purpose, my calling versus now in terms of how I feel. Uh, and so I think sometimes people are like, why should I even go through all this? We said earlier, it might be simple, but it's not easy. Why should I go through all this? What's the difference? So can you talk to us a bit about what life sort of feels like now versus before you had this shift or this moment? Um, you know, I love the, I love that when Elise said, um, earlier, she said simple. So I have this, I make everything into acronyms. And so I, um, discovered this acronym and it's, and it's simple and it's basically, and this will answer your question too. So how I am now is I get up in the morning and I set my intention for the day. Um, I know what it feels like to be in the darkness and that's not a place that I want to go anymore. And so we have a choice. We have a choice um, and, and it takes as much energy to stay stuck in that old um, paradigm than it does to actually choose to be happy or choose something better in your life. Um, the simple that I came up with one day, um, I went 
for a hike and I've been to this place four times and every time I go I trip and the one time I went I had just broken my toe a week before and I went and I tripped and I dislocated my toe on this on this um, hike and um, I was with my daughter and uh, thank God there was nobody else in the forest because the profanity that came out of my mouth was disgusting <laughs> but um, out of this came um this simple because when i got i looked at my clock when i got in the car it was 11 11 numbers um my daughter says to me mom turn on the radio because i feel like there'll be a message there i turned on the radio and the song that was playing on the radio was florida georgia oh oh we lost your sound oh the song that was playing was um simple and so i like to say now that life is really simple we we complicate it so i was complicating my life before by not really knowing um and then being totally out of alignment i had no idea what that was i had no idea what that looked like and if something felt almost you know i used to have this saying that it felt so good that it that it, that it felt so good that it was almost illegal when you when you know that you're in the flow you're in alignment you're being exactly your authentic self and you know who you're supposed to be it's just a, it's all about the feeling um and so the simple acronym that i came up with the s is strength because in this life to survive we need to be strong i is intention you have to have intention for everything that you do um m is mindset because it is all about your mindset and how you think uh p is purpose because in everything in life there's a purpose and we're here for a purpose l is love which because that's our natural state is love and it's the and it's the highest vibration and then e is all, ever evolving and so i came up with that acronym and thought am i supposed to do something with this am i supposed to but i just really think that that is how we're supposed to live our life using those that that simple acronym but because we're human beings and because we have um all these subconscious thoughts that really most of them come from our childhood we make uh -huh. things difficult they all because we think it's supposed to be so when i was being raised you know you have to work hard like you really have to work hard to get anywhere in life you have to make a lot of money if you want to be happy you know you have to you know if you've got too much money you're a snob if you don't have enough money you're poor if you're there was always judgment there was always put downs there was always and it was never about me just being me. I was compared to my brother and my sister. I was never just me. So where, you know, I find that in my life now, how my life has changed, I'm happy because I choose to be happy. I'm happy regardless of, of the challenges and the obstacles that are going on in my life because I choose happy. Um, I, I heard your stories earlier about if someone cuts you off in the car or someone you know, I just have a nice day. Like I, I do, because if you let stuff like that affect you, that's about you. It's not even about them, right? Mm -hmm. It's coming from you, right? Um, and it, it, there's a difference between reacting and responding. And so I choose to respond. I choose not to react. I choose to respond. And I send, even if you have mis, you know, misused me or abused me, or I send everybody love because that's, that's, what we're born with is love and that's what we know um but it's all as well about um fe really feeling your feelings and dealing with your emotions and dealing with that because if you don't feel that you think oh i'm going to stay stuck where i am because i'm safe and i'm comfortable but it's not because for the rest of your life you're going to be stuck there so if you do some work on yourself um and then every day practice that because that is a practice every day you don't just change and then okay this is it it's it's work every day if you don't do that it's much harder for well for me it was much harder because i've been through depression i've been in, in the dark it's not a good feeling it is really not a good feeling and you're you're not thriving you're merely just surviving because that's not what we're here for right so um it's way easier once you know how but it's getting to that place of knowing how and then doing the work. Or just making the choice without even having to know how, you know, like I think people get stuck in the, I need to know how, and then I can't make the choice. So just decide. And then the how shows up like the email in the middle of the night for you, you know, like I decided that I want to, I don't have to know how, you know, and that's the, how we get stuck in that. How at least, 
Oops. I learned was you need to know what. You need to know your what, what it is that you want, and you need to know why you want it. And then the how does show up. The, the, the universe will bring you opportunities. And if you listen to your, so I heard you say also in the last interview, it's about listening to yourself. We need to talk to ourselves more than we listen to ourselves. Because when we listen to ourselves, it's not actually even us, it's our subconscious mind. And normally it's negative. So I choose to talk to myself more than I listen to myself. And even my kids will say, are you talking to yourself again? Yep. <laughs> and it's not a crazy thing. It's a, I am talking to myself. I am, I am, you know, I'm believing in myself. I'm trusting in myself. I'm, I'm reiterating things to myself instead of allowing those negative, crazy thoughts to be in my head. I don't, my brain doesn't run away with itself anymore. My mouth talks, but I, but my brain doesn't, you know, I don't sit in those moments. I could be driving and not have a thought in my head for like ages. I just listen to my music or drive with no music. And I just, I'm just like, I'm so conscious. I'm so awake and I'm so conscious. And it's a much better feeling than feeling like you're drowning and suffocating every day. Mm -hmm. Much better. So do you, do you feel from your own personal experience, and I know that you've had many that you haven't even shared, right? The, the moments that have happened, I call them the game changing moments, right? They're game changing and life changing. And so you had this moment where you had this 15 minute cry and the voice came, whatever that weird voice was, that supernatural moment that, that came to you that said, okay, this is enough. So what would you say to somebody who hasn't had their moment on the floor for the, with a 15 minute cry and hasn't heard the voice yet? Because there, you know, when we do have those moments and, and I've had my moments and I have had more than one of them, believe me, I've had reminders, hello, you know, you were paralyzed once at 18 and all of these different things happen, but I do get reminders um, every day, really. So what would you suggest to somebody who hasn't had that, you know, hit the bottom, rock bottom, as we call it yet? Um, I personally don't believe that we have to hit rock bottom, but what would you suggest to somebody who's aware enough to know that something has to change, but they just aren't really quite sure what next step to take? So I think the first thing is that you really have to um, let go of trying to control your life because most of us have maybe an idea of what our life should be like and we compare our lives to other people. So let's say I'm a 30 year old, I'm not 30, but let's say I'm a 30 year old could be. woman <laughs> and um, I have a whole bunch of friends that are around the same age as me. And some, you know, they're getting married, they're having babies there. I'm actually telling us, it, it, this is my story, but that's not how I set out to answer this. But anyways, um, it's kind of like we have this vision for our life and we think our timeline is supposed to go along with everyone else's timeline. And I think that we have this, um, because we compare ourselves, we want to be like the Joneses. We don't want to be different from other people um, until something really feels off. And then we're not sure what to do about it. So I would, you know, um, I didn't know. You don't know what you don't know. And exactly. you have to go through, you have to go through um, all of those things in your journey because I believe that we come here as souls and we came here with a soul agreement and that all of those things that are in our journey you may not have to hit rock bottom, but you're going to come up against struggles, challenges, obstacles, and you have to figure out a way to get around that. And instead of playing the victim and blaming other people, there, you know, if you connect to other like-minded people, if you connect to meditation, if you connect to exercise and eating healthy and doing things that make you feel good and start listening, because the universe sends us messages all day every day but we just we don't want to listen to it because a lot of people are afraid of that woo woo they're afraid of what do you mean there's something else there's something there's something more than what than life there's something and it's different for every single one of us and my I, mm -hmm. I loved your um answer before about the perspective and the reality because one of us has a different perspective we're we're the same as human beings but we're all so unique in our own ways but um, so I think, I think for other people, it's like, you need to really stay in your own lane and look at your own life and not be comparing yourself to other people. There is no such thing as competition. There's, there's an abundance and billions and billions and billions of things to go around for everybody. Stay in your own lane, follow your own timeline, do what feels right for you and not what 
someone else has done and not be comparing yourself to someone else's journey because your timeline is different from theirs. They have to go through what they know and the universe will give you what you need when you need it, not what you want when you want it. So stay open and be like ready and ask other people that have already gone through an awakening. What is it like? Because it's different stages to an, an awakening as well, right? So I didn't know. I didn't know who to go to. And when I had a friend who started telling me, I was like, oh, no, that 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 can't be. What? No, that can't be real. That can't be. I, I can't be doing that. That's not who I am. And now that I'm on the completely other side, it's like, why was I resist? I was so resistant to all of this um, for so long. And it, it just, but I, I think just to, um, to say to people, like, um, just listen, because there is a, a force outside of you that's way bigger. And if you don't listen, if you keep resisting it, that what you resist persists, it's going to keep showing up. And get louder. <laughs> and, yes. And, and the obstacles and the challenges will be harder mm -hmm. because you keep resisting it. And it's going to be like, oh, you didn't learn the last time. Well, maybe you'll learn this time. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's there. I mean, there's no doubt about in my mind about that. It's there and it shows up. And if we're not listening, it will get worse. And then you will hit rock bottom <laughs> if you don't listen. Right. Like me. Yeah, exactly. I have, a, I have a story to share on that note, if I can grab a second. And um, so it was, this was one of the, I've, we all have pivotal moments. I don't know, people say it's every seven years or whatever. I don't even know what year I was on, but it was a year, it was during the holidays. And I just, I knew I was going to go dark. I actually consciously made the choice. I'm like, I'm going dark. I'm not going to be in charge of making the holidays and the lockies and the Christmas and because we were Christmas Jews. So we did Christmas and Hanukkah. Like, and I'd be the one to organize the event and the party and cook. And I just, I was like, I'm done. Like, I'm out, you know? And my dad wasn't doing that well. And, and, and long story short, I was talking to a girlfriend in the middle of my, you know, dark place, which is nice when you make a conscious choice to go there because it's like I knew I was in control of the crap, but it was still crappy. And I was talking to a girlfriend and we were going through like my son was doing a, well. He had just graduated getting a software development, you know, he was getting his bachelor's. My dad wasn't doing well, but every, everybody was okay though. And I realized in that moment that I'm actually okay. Like I was more okay than, than I gave myself credit for. I made a conscious choice to kind of clear out some of the muck. I was having a conscious clearing. And I remember saying, I almost missed it, right? This is not what I thought okay was going to look like. I thought okay was going to look like entirely different, but I'm like more okay right now than I've been in a long time or ever really. And so you can, you, you might miss your okay. So it is uh, to what you're speaking of, becoming aware of, uh, of where you're at really right now, not compared to anything else, but how okay are you? You might be way more okay than you ever were before and you might miss it. Like I almost missed how okay I was without having, if I hadn't had that conversation and a lot of things shifted and changed. And from then on, it's been shifting and changing and it had before that too. But I just remember that profound moment of, oh my gosh, I almost missed it. I almost missed how okay I am. So I wanted to share that story. So I want to jump in for a sec too, Maggie, before, and I have a follow-up question for you here. But uh, one thing I want to share as well, just along the same thought, a couple things. Uh, that you mentioned. One, uh, you talked about, um, and I can't remember the exact wording, but about uh, the how will kind of work itself out. And so I have this quote, I always say, if the why, if your why is strong enough, you'll figure out the how. Um, but also I wanted to add, because I think it's, it's sort of timely, as far as the, um, we're talking about uh, this awakening that people have, at least I know you mentioned this a few times, do you have to hit rock bottom? And I want to share the opposite scenario of that because my awakening was different than what 90% of what I hear people's awakenings relate to. So most people seem to have an awakening when they're going toward rock bottom or their life, they say, I need this change. Now, my life wasn't going in the right direction, but the catch is, is that I was, I wasn't like, I didn't realize anything was going wrong, but it also wasn't like um, a thing where I was having these major, like this needs to shift or anything. But what happened for me is, and you know about this story at least, is that I got tricked into performing stand-up comedy one night and that trick turned into me finding my calling and purpose. 
And so the what, the passion, is speaking and getting my message out that way. The why was because I wanted to create a positive ripple in other people's lives. But why I bring this up is because for me, it was the opposite. It wasn't that I had to hit a rock bottom. It was that I discovered a, a top that I wanted to get to. So it was like, for me, it was a positive. It was more like, I instead of me going, I need to change because this is the end. It was the opposite scenario where I'm like, wow, look, this could be a new fresh beginning. And so that's just to back that up and explain this. That's why I wrote the book, the book that I put out called the book of why and how was because that's how powerful finding my why was for me. It was my version of the rock bottom. And so I don't think we have to go to rock bottom. I think it can be the opposite scenario where we discover what we've been looking for, even when we're not looking. So I just and that feels to, so much better, doesn't it, Corey? Yeah, it definitely <laughs> feels definitely, better hearing it even. <laughs> but I will say to, to Maggie's point, because that's why I asked her what it was like before and after. Right. Is my life though before that, I wasn't like hitting rock bottom, but my life was uh, such that I was more negative. I had battled generalized anxiety for a few years. I battled hypochondria. So it wasn't like a rock bottom, but you know, my my professional life was on fire, and my personal life was always this challenge of. What am I missing? What am I not doing? So, but it wasn't like I hit this per moment where like, this is the worst or I got to change this, but it was still not great. I mean, if I look at the two different lives, it's like a different me altogether. But I just want to add in, there is there are times I think we can do the other thing, which is try to find what our calling is and our purpose is. And if we get the push to do that, even before we hit rock bottom, maybe we never have to get there. Having said that, Maggie, uh, to bring you into that side of the conversation, uh, have you figured out what your why is? And if so, do you have you articulated it as well? Um, I don't know that I've articulated it as well as I probably could sometimes. But yeah, my why is because um, so I was one of these women who had I had no confidence and no self esteem, and um, I, I really. I, I, you know, when I was a, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a police officer and I lived in Scotland, as you can probably tell by my accent, I was born in Scotland. Um, I wanted to be a police officer and I was like, I think one or two inches too short. So I thought, well, I could never do that. And then the other idea that I had was, well, maybe I could be a counselor. I think I'd be a really good counselor, but I never really shared that with anybody because um, a lot of British people are very, well, especially when I was a kid, um, you went and you worked in a factory. Like you go and you get a good job in a factory and that's your life kind of thing, right? So they didn't really have a lot of like aspirations and, you know, want to be something really better. Um, and I, so I never really told anybody. And then I came to Canada on my own when I was 18. I actually left Scotland and came to Canada on my own, came here as a nanny and kind of never went back. And I always, in the back of my mind, had this idea that my why was because I, I knew deep inside of me that I really wanted to help people. I, I just, I didn't know how, I just knew that I was put on this planet to really help people. I knew that I, there was something inside of me that I had not allowed yet to come out, but I knew that it was there. Um, and I knew that even if I did it for free, even if I just kind of fell into something, uh, that was what I was gonna do, but I did not believe in myself. I didn't believe that I could actually do it. Those little voices in my head, like, who do you think you are to think that you could counsel people? What could you tell people to help people? And then I ended up getting a job. I did get a job with Metro Police, but not as a police officer, but as a special constable working in the courts. And I did that for, that became my career for 14 years. So I basically locked up rapists and druggies and whatever, um, which was very different from uh, where I thought I was going. Um, but I absolutely loved the job and I, Although I was working with, um, you know, different um, people in society, I, I, I helped them. Even although they were there for, you know, you, you've been accused of doing certain things, I, I always found empathy and I always tried to make the day a little bit better because they're sitting in jail. It's not fun sitting in jail. And I always tried to do something just to make them laugh or smile or just to, you know, to, um, uh, make them feel a little bit better about the situation and that's kind of who I am and I'm very like um, uh, like I speak my truth I'm very honest I'm very I will challenge you not in a like I don't believe you kind of thing but I will challenge you to really look at your core and look at your beliefs and and is that really what you feel or is that what you've been taught and um, so I think my I, I think my why really is 
because I did have to struggle so much in my life. Um, and I know deep down inside that this is my purpose. Um, and, and I don't really know how to explain it as my why. It's just something that it's just within me. It's just, uh, it's like an inner knowing. I just know that's what I'm supposed to do. So, um, it's just, it drives me every day. Like right now I I'm part owner and, um, I'm the manager in a restaurant and, um, sometimes, you know, customers will come in. I mean, most of our customers are great. I'm, I'm uh, operating a vegan restaurant. And my big thing is I'm not just selling you food. I'm offering you an experience when you walk into my restaurant. Mm. So the minute someone comes in the door, it's like, Hey, how's it going? How's your day going? Where do you come from? Where? And I start a conversation with them and they always leave a little bit brighter than they were when they came in. And that to me is my why that's my, I'm here to mix other people's lives just that little bit better. Even if it's only for a split second in the day, um, that's my why. And that's why I do it. It's just an inner knowing. I can't really explain it any better than that. I think you did a great job. <laughs> You're brightening up the world, girl. What else can you say? Just You're making the world a brighter place. Yeah, it's just a, it's just within me. And mm -hmm. food is the best way to do it. Mm. And so, Maggie, as we start to wind ourselves down, um, I'd love to get your take before we ask you how we can connect with you and maybe learn more, whether that's on social media or wherever your preferred place is, uh, and how people can work with you. Uh, I'd love to ask you, or I asked this to the last guest, so I, I'm going to try to ask this most or as often as possible this week, but are you a reader, a book reader? And if so, do you have a favorite book or two to recommend or a podcast or whatever your chosen medium is? Okay. Uh, so I love videos. I love, um, I love just finding random videos on, um, on, uh, YouTube, but, uh, one of the books that I've read that's amazing, but it's a little, it's a little too deep for some people is, um, Dr. Dr. Michael Singer, The Untethered Soul. Um, it's an amazing book and it really helped me to hone in on, um, who I am, why I think the way I think that I'm not. I'm not weird. I'm not, but I'm not normal. I'm what's normal anyway, right? I'm normal for me. Um, but that's one of the books that I, and I'm trying to highlight the parts that are really important, but I've highlighted almost the whole thing because it's, because it's such a well-written book. The other book that I read, and it's not a spiritual book, but it really had an effect on me was Michelle Obama's Becoming book. Um, because that woman knows who she is. She's very self-aware. Uh -huh. She's strong she's resilient she's beautiful um and i don't have a lot of people that really inspire me and i know that may sound kind of weird but i inspire myself because i've had to i've had to survive my life and so how i get inspired is by saying look how far you've come maggie look what you've done look what you've you're resilient and you're strong so keep don't give up keep going but I would have to say, yeah, Michelle Obama's book and The Untethered Soul. Um, I also love listening to T.D. Jakes, who's a bishop down in, the, down in Georgia in the States. Um, and I sometimes listen to his videos or I've read a couple of his books as well because he's very to the point and logical and simple, very simple. So that's what wow. I like. Yeah. So uh, just so you can see this, Linda post that my favorite book and she was talking about well it, I saw it come in when you were talking about the untethered soul so I'm assuming it was that one versus Michelle Obama and it's interesting you mentioned the untethered soul because that's a book I, I was looking over to the shelf I'm sure I have it on the shelf here somewhere and I picked it up and I think Shelly read more of it than me and I, I to your point about it being deep I kind of tapped out a couple times I think but it keeps getting brought up again so I think it's time I dive back in because I always feel like um, you know, when, when I'm ready, the book will appear. And so, you know, like for example, um, the first, the first book I read was, um, thinking, sorry, how to win friends and influence people. Second book I read was thinking grow rich and thinking grow rich was maybe a little too, there's parts of thinking rich people don't realize this, but it was a little too spiritual for me at the time. And I don't mean spiritual, like religious, but I mean like talking about, uh, the ether and putting energy out into the world. And, you know, like a lot of people don't realize this, but he really, in a lot of ways was the one that uh, kind of brought the law of attraction to the world, Napoleon Hill. Uh, a lot of people that 
Ron DeBurn gets the most credit for it. Uh, and there's people who talk about it before Napoleon Hill, but Napoleon Hill articulated it best. He, most people say he coined the phrase mastermind in terms of what a mastermind is. Well, I wasn't ready for those things when I first read, even though the second book I read, I took a lot from it, but I took the practical stuff. I had to go back to it. So I think the untethered soul is one of those things. Uh, at least I'll ask you before I bring uh, Maggie back into this. Um, did you, have you ever read the untethered soul? I have never read The Untethered Soul, but I want to go back to Think and Grow Rich. There's another book that Napoleon Hill wrote that came up to me a couple of times. I actually had a guest. I think it was Don Cohn or somebody we had on. He was from Vegas. I can't remember his last name. Sorry, Don, but it was a great interview. And he brought this book up to me again, and it's something I highly recommend, and it's called Outwitting the Devil. And it was also by Napoleon Hill, and he had actually transitioned, as I call it, first before the book, actually the manuscript was published, and it is incredible. And actually it sums everything that every single one of us that is doing here on the Blue Talk stage, whether it's the Flip Your Script experience or Amplify Your Message, Yes. And I have to tell you, I'm not a reader. So I actually went on to YouTube and I don't want to like say this out loud, but it's free, the entire book. And what I loved about it is it's audio and the devil and Napoleon Hill have, there's two different voices. So you actually have this, the, the voice of the devil and the devil is really a metaphor. Okay. So, cause when I first got the book, I was like, I'm not really into the whole devil side of things, you know, like I'm a flip your script, Abraham Hicks, you know, focus on, you know, find a better feeling thought. And when I, when it came up again, I, I always take the advice. I take the message and I went on and I got the audio and it was game changing for me. And it really was a confirmation more than anything else. Like I find things as confirmations. I'm on the right path, girl. You're on the right path. You get it. Cause you know, we question ourselves and I love getting those nuggets. Like both of you today are confirmations for me. Always. I'm looking at a mirror and outwitting the devil is definitely something I highly recommend. And when you figure out what the devil is, you're going to recognize that this whole thoughts create, <laughs> the, the thoughts are our real paintbrush for us being creators in the world. And when we start to use them intentionally, it's it really is a game changer. And when the devil gets a hold of you, which is a metaphor, um, it pulls us out of alignment. And so a lot of us are really just out of alignment. I mean, really, we're always there's always an alignment and we're just out of it. So being in depression means that you have more of an opportunity to be so in alignment and so connected that it's awesome. I have one question that I would like to ask Maggie. Um, and I always kind of ask our guests this because I talk about thought weeds and these are the weeds of thought that get form beliefs from childhood. And I always ask about my, oops. Do we, do we still have Maggie there? I don't see her on my screen. Can you hear us, I Maggie? I wanted to get her mind speed. Hmm. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, well, Corey, you're going to have to share a mind seed with us then. Okay. Well, she, <laughs> we might, to leave something. she might appear right back up, but I want, okay. since, uh, since this happened, uh, I'm going to mention one thing about outwitting the devil and maybe mm -hmm. I'll take a mind seed from that book. Okay. Uh, we're reading it right now. You mentioned about the um, uh, outwitting the devil and published after his, he passed on. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know the story behind this, but he wrote the book one year after Think and Grow Rich. I wrote the manuscript. Yep. And what happened was his wife wouldn't let him publish it. Well, he was told that he wouldn't last, even like during this whole writing of this manuscript, he was like, they were, I mean, he was warned not to write this book for, for reasons that we don't want to give away. We don't want to like, but go ahead. Well, yeah. And, and, but his wife was scared. The reason behind her uh, not wanting to publish, her reasoning was she was actually working for a minister and she, he brought her on. And I think he brought in Napoleon to do some lectures or something, but she was worried how the religious community would view the whole concept of how he was pitching and presenting the devil. And she was also worried about, because you gotta remember the time we're talking about, 1938, mm -hmm. it, just, it was too deep and too much. But the interesting part of the story is, so she, she said, you're not allowed to publish it until after my passing. Well, he passed in 1970. Now the book was written in 1938. Right. So she passed. he passed in 1970, she lived in 1984, and she was still wouldn't publish the book, and she gave it to her nephew. And yes. her nephew wanted to publish it, but then his wife said, you're not publishing that book while I'm alive. And so I think, I, I might have this date wrong, but I think his wife passed in 2011, something like that. Uh, and then the book came out, I'm trying to remember what year. I see you there, Maggie, so we'll bring you back on. Um, but the book, what year did it come out? Do you remember, Elise? I know, I watched, I listened to the audio, remember? <laughs> yeah, so I think it was like, I wanna, okay, right here, I should have it. But I want to say, I think it was like eight years ago or something. Like it was not that long ago. I think it was like 2000 and 
2012 or something. But anyway, yeah. the point is, is that uh, it was all those years later that when his wife passed on, he handed it over to the CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation, who then reached out to Sharon Lecter and said, will you help me bring this book to life? So again, it was written in 1938, I believe it was, because Think and Grow Rich came out in 37. And all that time later, the book didn't come out. And Sharon said she wondered if like, it was almost like the meaning of the book, the devil was keeping it from coming out until now. We were, you know, it was like the top world wasn't ready for it. But the wild part is when you read this book or when you listen to the audio, what's going to blow you away is how dead on Napoleon Hill was about what our world is even like today, 70 plus years ago. This, the stuff that we're talking about or the stuff that I talk about, you know, oh, this new age stuff. This is not new age. This is like, we're talking, like, let's just talk say jesus okay and i'm not so religion is the what should i call it the packaging for spirituality right it's how we package spirituality this is i mean jesus spoke of this this is old information that just has been kept from us so the whole flipping your script and your thoughts matter it's not the end all be all but it's definitely a place to start definitely a place to start. So this information isn't woo-woo. We've made it woo-woo or maybe mainstream or maybe religions have made it woo-woo or corporations have made it woo-woo to keep it out of our hands and think that it's too much for us and it doesn't apply to who we are as humans. And it couldn't be more false. It's so scientifically proven on so many levels that the way that we think is how we create. And so it is, I know that you've all, you know, some of us drank the, it's a woo-woo Kool-Aid, but it really is, it has nothing to do with woo-woo. Weird is supernatural. We use the word weird more than I can even tell you. And people who are weird aren't sort of, what should I say? Because it might give away the book. Mm. They aren't like, you know, the devil's not tapping on their shoulder. And if the devil is tapping on their shoulder, they're just, they're still recognizing that their consciousness and their thoughts are their own. And, you know, we don't have to comply. I'm going to leave it at that. Absolutely. Well, and I know we have to close things out, but at least I know you had a question for Maggie. And since we lost her, I want to give Maggie a chance to answer that question. Uh, and then Maggie, if you're okay, I might have a quick question as well. And then we'll just find out how we can learn more. So at least did you want to ask the question for Maggie that yes. you had originally wanted to ask? Yes, this is, this is a question that I ask all of my amazing beings that I get to come in contact with. Uh, so I talk about thought weeds and belief weeds. And these are the thoughts and the weeds that have been rooted since childhood. But I also believe that once these weeds are pulled, we need to replant a seed of thought, right, in our fertile mind. And I'm wondering if you would have a mind seed, as I call them, to share with our viewers that they could maybe help them shift their perspective or or plant in their mind in place of a thought weed um, and help them start to grow um, a happier, healthier, more abundant life that they love and love themselves in. Hmm. Um, okay, so what comes to mind is, um, this is something that I learned a few years ago, that most of our subconscious thoughts, most of our limiting beliefs all come from, I'm going to call them common denominators, three common denominators. So they are your parents or caregivers, anybody who raised you, anybody who played a part in your childhood, raising you in, in your childhood. Then there's trauma, because we all experience some kind of trauma. None of us are exempt from it. And then there is, what's the third one? Oh my gosh, I said trauma. Uh, oh, and then repetition. Because when we are children, we are, like everything's repeated. Our schedule for school is repeated. The way that we're disciplined or punished is repeated. The things that we're told is repeated. The things that we do is repeated. And this, until we're like age six or seven, we have no subconscious. Everything is just real to us. And, and everything is like, oh, it's exactly as we as we um, picture it. Then we start to um, take on limiting beliefs and we start to take on other people's beliefs, which become our, our mindset. Um, to replace some of these beliefs so part of the thing that i do in my coaching is that i dig out these i'll call them weeds because i like thought weeds yeah uh, I think it, I think but i dig these out of people and they don't even realize they have it because it's dug in deep into their subconscious right so it's like peeling back the layers of the onion to get to the core because those things are not what make you you those are things that people trauma repetition made you believe that you were you. So if you could have, um, if I could, let's say, um, wave a magic wand and make you or give you options as to what you want your life to look like now and who you want to be at this time, 
because we're always becoming somebody different. And for each new level of our growth, we need to become a different person because, and you mentioned this, I think as well, at least that we're never the same people like for two seconds and we're always changing, right? Our, our, our thoughts are always changing. So I would, you know, if we can spend so much time being stuck in the beliefs of other people and being stuck in the past and being stuck in things that really don't serve us, just to take a chance on, you know, that question we always ask, what if, and it's always in the negative, what if this is a risk and what if it doesn't work out? Or what if I fail? Or what if people don't like me? Or what if, try asking the question, what if in the positive? What if this is the best decision that I could ever make? I love what that. What if this is the first day of the rest of my life and it's way better than all of the years before now? Like, what if I make this decision today and everything changes for me? It's a scary thought for a lot of people, but honestly, it's a total shift in your paradigm. And if you can just change that, like pivot your mind to be like- Flip it, it maybe? Right? Yeah, yeah, I, I say pivot. Um, if you could just um, pivot your mind to something a little bit better, and you mentioned Abraham Hicks, and I studied mm -hmm. through Abraham Hicks, right? So um, shifting your mindset. But even just pivot and ask that question. And if you ask that question and you repeat the what if for six to eight seconds, so it's like a little exercise. So you say, what if this is a great decision I'm making? What if things work out? What if this feels really good when I make this choice? What if, and you keep doing that all in the positive for six to eight seconds, it completely changes your energy and completely sends out a different vibration to the universe. So that would be my little- I love that. that. Replace the seed for six to eight seconds. And honestly, if you do that, you can feel, you feel different at the end of six to eight seconds. And it's just your mindset. You're telling your mind something different. That's it. It's simple. Maggie, I gotta tell you, that's one of my favorite mind seeds that anyone has shared because it's, it's, tangible it's doable it's applicable it's applicable and it's really it is six to eight seconds i mean if you can hold it for 17 you're lucky but it, just start in that six to eight seconds the what if positive i'm doing it i'm starting it right now it's actually 68 seconds oh 68 i thought you said six to eight <laughs> it's six to eight seconds so when you're doing it it feels like oh my god i can't think of anything else to say but if you can get into the practice of doing that to just change your mind, to change your, your vibration, it makes a huge difference. You feel like like your energy has shifted and so the, the world has been lifted off your shoulders. And watch what shows up. That's the best part. The most exciting part is that things are gonna like miraculously show up in your life, like right away even. Yeah, and that's, it's, the, and it's that's a, the fun part. And it's a tiny little thing. It's just mm -hmm. a tiny little thing that you can do. I like keeping it really simple. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I love that. Megan. So I, uh, I love it. So I've been trying to keep track of when I'm turning off and on. So I love that, Maggie. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for everything you've shared today. Uh, the last part, I mentioned one last question. It's probably the most important uh, for those you mentioned when you're working with clients that you're coaching. You mentioned the restaurant, if you want to share where that is. <laughs> I want to know when I come with my RV and we can come back into Canada, you know, I'll be showing up. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Eddie, where would people connect with you? Uh, where would you send them? What would be the hub or the, if it's social media, where would you send them? I'm just wondering where you would tell people to connect with you. Okay. So, where you can find me is on Facebook. That's my thing. I'm from the older generation, so Facebook is my thing. Um, I have a personal page on Facebook, just Maggie Slider, and then I have a business page, and it's called Find Yourself Coaching. Um, and it's on Facebook. I am on Instagram too, but I'm under Instagram and, uh, as Maggie It Up on Instagram. Um, and my restaurant is in Mississauga. Um, it's uh, 88 Burnham Thorpe Road West. It's right across the street from Square One. It's on the main floor of the Sussex Center and it's called Copper Branch. And it's a franchise that opened up four years ago in Ontario and started in Quebec. And I think we are the 20, 20th or 22nd um, location in Ontario. And the food is amazing. It's a gorgeous restaurant. The atmosphere is fabulous. And the, and the, the customer service is amazing.
So is so it eat is it eatcopperbranch.com? Uh it's uh, um yeah, I think there is eat before it. Yeah. yeah. I'm on uh -huh. there right now. I'm gonna yeah. share it. Yeah. And the food uh -huh. is amazing. Like you don't need to be vegan to oops. Food is amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Stuff. Well, Maggie, like I said, this has been an absolute pleasure. I'll call it a to be continued. Thank you uh, so much for showing up, especially like you say, in the country, uh, having, you know, uh, obviously Wi-Fi is always a challenge when you're not in the city. So thank you for working through that, being here with us, and you absolutely crushed it. So I just want to thank you. And like I say, with your permission, call it to be continued for the next time. Thank you so much. This was the first time I've ever done anything like this. So <laughs> it was awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you, Elise, for your uh, your words of encouragement. And yeah, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I have to thank say, we you. we never know it's your first time. We've been doing this a lot. And I've been doing this for- I know. I'm so years. impressed. You go, girl. You got time. this. So you crushed it. If that's your first time, it's all up from there. My first time. All right. OK. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Maggie. We'll talk to you later. Awesome. Well, what a great couple of guests we had today. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, I, and it's funny because we went a bit over time, but we actually had a shorter day today, so kind of balanced out. And uh, and we went some directions that I didn't think we'd go, like talking about outwitting the devil. I never saw that coming. Um, From I, me, right? Like the non-reader always like, I'm going to throw this one out there because I just I just finished listening to it. And it was a game. It was a confer It wasn't a game changer for me. It was a confirmation. It's well, I will say, like you said, I don't want to. For people that are discovering it for the first time, I don't want to give anything away, but I will just say, like, as a obviously, people probably know that I'm a pretty big Napoleon Hill fan. Um, I just got his brand new book. Uh, it's technically his new book. They released a book with his stuff on uh, Andrew Carnegie. So essentially, he wrote up 17, uh, I think, 17 lessons that he learned. And uh, the first book has four, I think. So they're going to probably release a different book every few years. And then I'll oh, check that out. Also, uh, Three Feet from Gold, which was uh, put out by the Napoleon Hill Foundation based on his premise about when you're uh, about the guy in the story and think grow rich that was digging for gold and gave up and then sold the land because he thought there's no gold there. And then the next person came in believing there was gold there and then hired a team. And the goal was three feet from where the other guy stopped. The first guy stopped. I heard that story before. Well, and it's it's in the in thinking grow rich. But the premise is, is that most people work hard, but then quit just before they were about to have success. Maybe you're the one who said, I think you're the one who shared that story, Corey. I, I you're, a good, you're a good short story sharer. <laughs> oh, thank you. But yeah, so, I mean, so I'm a big uh, Napoleon Hill fan. And the reason I say that is because what I love is that all of his writing and books are different from each other, which is rare. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but also how far ahead of his time he was. Again, the law of attraction, he was studying, I think, under people that talked with the law of attraction before him. Uh, but the mastermind, of course, we, people are using masterminds for, I don't know, forever. But he actually said, here's how you organize a mastermind. But these things, like he was talking about almost 100 years ago, and some people are still discovering them now. Well, if you think about it, like the masterminds were elite, right? And it was it was an elite type of thing, you know, like the elite mastermind. And they made it elite, right? It was like brand. It has to be only the elite can have a mastermind. It says who and who's elite? Elite's a state of mind. Hundred percent. And you know? it, it kind of I think introduced it to the world because what he said in the book is you need to get together with another person and study this book or two people and study this book. So it was like right. you don't realize it, but if you do that, you're actually a mastermind now without realizing you became a mastermind solely to study the book. Uh, so anyway, I'm glad we went there. I thought it was really cool that we talked with that book because mm -hmm. that book has been out uh, for a while, and I think it would have been one of those books like. Napoleon Hill's books have sold 120 million copies. I would guess that uh, Thinking Grow Rich is about 110 million of that or 100 million. Wow. And so I feel like Outwitting the Devil would have been similar if it would have been released then. And I feel like it's one of these books that kind of got passed over because it was so much separate from Thinking Grow Rich. And because well, you know, but you think about that too, even Think and Grow Rich. I mean, they took out pieces of think and grow rich from the original because it was too it was too connected right it was it had it hold it held the key it held the code so they took all the, the codes out or the key elements out of it and then they republished it right so oh well devil the the public's not going to be able to handle the word devil listen humans created the word devil and the definition of devil devil doesn't come from universal source devil is something man made right and we've created this concept of devil to keep somebody away from their ultimate freedom and so it has nothing to do with the guy with the red ears and, you know, fire burning in hell. Like that's also 
I shouldn't say it's man-made, right? I don't want to say that on the, it. Potentially, a human had to come up with a concept so we could verbalize it and we can understand it. Let's just put it that way. Where the message came from, I don't know. But um, so that you know, the fact that it has devil in it, you know, people are like, oh, I don't think it's a good idea, whatever that means. But the devil is really just an, is a con is the contrast in which we all are challenged with on a daily basis. Well, and I think the other aspect, I, you're 100 percent correct there. And I think the other aspect of what his wife was worried about. And then there's other, one other thing I want to mention about flip your script uh, from previous times. I made a note to mention this, but. What his wife was also worried about, I believe, is the way he talks about religion in schools and what he felt was the problem with religion in schools. And so I give people forewarning when you go into this book, just go in with an open mind. But he is going to talk in the book about what he thinks is wrong with the school system. And spoiler alert, it hasn't changed much since he wrote the book. Well, actually, this global plot twist has shifted yeah. all of it. I mean, we were in an outdated education system anyway that needed a shift and a change and needed something really big to shake it up. And now look, I mean, we have virtual learning. The doors are open. Teachers are able to express themselves and be creative and teach from their heart and from their passion and their purpose. And so things are changing. And we think, and where are they changing from? They're changing from an adverse situation that could be are you waiting or are you creating, right? So the situation's helping us to be more creative in the way that we go about learning who we are and finding our passions and being more, um, what should I say, more heart-driven. Mm -hmm. Well, and to that point, I mean, yeah, I should, I, I, as you were, just as you were starting to say it, I realized we've just hit a point where the shift is finally happening. But right. here we were spoken in 2019, Again, from how many years later? And I, I didn't have Yeah, you're to totally right. I mean, it just happens to be this time frame, but yeah. but, but but the message is clear. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll let people read it and discover it for themselves, but it is a game changing book. For me, it was actually as somebody who uh, looked at Thinking Grow Rich as a game changing book. I was super excited to discover something new that got me a, a start over, a do over. When did you start reading it? I had no idea. This wasn't like pre uh, chat. We didn't talk about this. Like, I didn't send you a text and go, This is the book I'm going to mention. No, no. I, I started reading it a while back, like mm -hmm. a, a digital version, and I actually bought the book more recently. So okay. I'm pounding through it again right now. And, uh, and Shelly's up next for reading it. Uh, it. It talks, I mean, I'll say one thing, like just in terms of how far ahead he seemed to be, is he talked about at the time in 1938 or whatever, how people didn't see smoking as a bad or a good thing. Like they, they didn't view it that way. But if you remember from the book, he said his reasoning for why he felt it was a bad thing is because it's a habit. It's a habit that for a lot of people, they don't have control over when they choose. And, and that, and you know, I'm not going to go into the plot, but I mean, that ties into the people he feels have uh, a defense against what he considers the devil. And, but it's interesting how back then you'd be hard pressed to find very many people that would say smoking's a bad thing. They right. just kind of didn't know either way. And so I just feel like he was really ahead of his time. But having said all that, flip switching gears a bit, um, one of the things that I want to mention is that uh, somebody asked me one time when, when they come on the show as a guest, you know, do people still buy um, at virtual events, so people still invest in virtual events because we were sh this whole shift you just mentioned from in person, where we know if I go in person and I have my book at the back of the room, there's going to be some people to buy it. If I'm launching a program, there's going to be some people to sign up. And I, this is just something that popped my head because I saw it sitting over my desk. The question of do people still invest in in virtual, or is it just now going to be our uh, placeholder until we get back to live. And I was just thinking of the fact that um, you, I think, bought it as well, but I bought um, Dr. Porter's um, brain, brain mapping. You Wait, hold on one second. Are you ready? I'm going to jump. I have it right next to my bed. I brained. It's brain tapping. Hold on. I'm going to go grab it. So that's funny how we both just disappeared from everybody watching, but I figured I'd show mine as well. So... <laughs> this was totally not planned, but I got my we head. both have our brain tapping on. There. I think you're on mute. I think you got yourself on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So we both, my, my point of this was we both invested in brain tap, and I get two of them, actually. So three of them. Really? For what? But for Shelly as well, because I figured that, you know, 
we're all traveling in different circles. But my point is, he sold free brain tapping things for coming onto the show. So do people still invest from virtual? Uh, Catherine B. Roy, I won't share her business, but I will tell you, she said I, she said I could share that she had nine sales calls after she was presented on our event. And then uh, the other one, which is kind of intriguing, is, um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Jeff Hazlett with C-Suite Network. I, since then, I've actually started the process of bringing all of my content over to C-Suite Network since we had him on. I don't, was that on Amplify? I don't think it was on this stage. Oh, I, mean, I thought you were on that day as the guest. You, there was one maybe. day you- Maybe. Uh, maybe not. I might have been. No, I, I think, you know what, now that I think about it, I think I know who was on with me. I think it was Kelly. Okay. But point of the story is um, I ended up signing up for his uh, whole network. And by the way, tomorrow or Wednesday, while we're on, as soon as we finish, Seth Godin's going to be the guest on um, on the C-Suite Network. So I'm going to dive into there as soon as we're done to go check out Seth Godin. But my point is- Love him. What what I have his book. It's The Prize Inside or something it's called. No, what is his book? Um, the he has purple a book. pig. It's a purple pig, or I don't. It's something about what is it called? I have his book. The purple cow. The purple cow, right? Something yeah. like that. There's the purple cow. Yes, the purple pig. I love that. Whatever. Um, it's an animal. Purple, unexpected, purple. but it's the unexpected gift. Yes, he has. He has like about well, he has about twelve books, I think, out, and they're all like the same style. They're all really tiny books. Uh, I, I, I the dip is another big one of his. The Icarus Principle is, I think, another one. And on and on, and uh, but yeah, so Seth's going to be on there, and so I'll get a chance probably to ask questions and stuff. I mean, that's a cool opportunity because of the fact that I think Jeff and him must know each other, and Jeff's bringing him on. But my point is, virtual events, right? You know, so Seth will be on, and there'll be a book of his that I forgot that I didn't even look up or anything, and I'll end up buying that book after I see him on there. Right. right. So I just wanted to point out that when we think about you know the world's changed, but does that mean that there's no business happening because we're virtual? I don't know why. No, this I mean, I have people reach out to me and I get, they see something, a flip your script Friday or um, a replay and they'll reach out and we'll start coaching together and working, you know, moving forward together and, you know, have game changing experiences. And, you know, so there's so many different opportunities available and it's about wait, are you waiting or are you creating? And I promise you, if you're waiting, you've always been waiting. If you've been creating, you've always been creating. And the beautiful thing about that is we always have an opportunity right now to shift. Flip it, Absolutely. flip your script, flip the flip internal that. script, you know, yeah. and, and, and if you want to create, ask you what, what's holding me from creating, let that poo go and become a creator. See how you, you know what I say to my clients, Corey, I'm like, just see how you like it, right? Mm -hmm. You know what it's like to be a waiter. You can always go back and wait, right? You've already nailed that. You've perfected that version of yourself. So just try something new. And if you really don't like it, you can always go back because you've already became, you already mastered it. Absolutely. Well, and I don't even know why I went there. Like, why well, I never know. I trust the universe. But I saw this sitting over the table and I just thought I'd mention that. It's kind of a show to for them, but also to say, at yes, people, we are still humans. We are still, if we see somebody we like, we still typically will find a way to grab that thing. And so mm -hmm. we've talked about books today, like The Untethered Soul. And I didn't put this uh, up because it was right while we were finishing out with Maggie. But Linda mentioned that she just dug it out and it's her fourth go through. Highly right. recommend it. So when I'm talking about books, for example, The Untethered Soul, there'll be somebody that from listening to this will go buy The Untethered Soul. And or the truth, Outwitting the Devil. Or Outwitting the Devil. And I'll go pick up The Untethered Soul and start reading it because I got to get through it at some point. But I just want to add, just want to add in because this isn't about why should you be a part of blue tops this i'm saying this is about uh yes people the world has shifted but we are still humans and we are still going to see experts we like in some capacity and right. some people are going to reach out whatever exactly. that looks like so Corey, um, i want to remind you that i'm going to be at another event tomorrow um, yes. I don't want to like cross over, but I should tell Laura Lake was a guest and, and, and I think the tickets are already sold. I don't know if you could buy a ticket. It's a ticketed event. So here you go. This is a great example. This is an interactive virtual event, right? So this is interactive as well, but we're kind of in a screen. This is really awesome. I think it's called air meet that she's using. And you actually sit at the tables with your, with people at the event. So it's like you're at the event, you hang out, you go backstage. Um, anyway, it's called the Solopreneur Conference. It's the first one. It's Solopreneur Conference 2020. 
if it's not something you can make it, definitely jump on here. I might actually even be able to be here because I'm not on until four. I'm one of the last keynote speakers. So I'll see how the day goes. I can jump on here. If not, it's all you tomorrow and I'll be back on Wednesday. Absolutely. And I just put the link in. I just went and checked. Uh, you can still technically buy tickets on the website. I don't know what that looks like on the back end, meaning I don't know if she just didn't take that part down. So you might be able to see it. I'm sure. I mean, the event doesn't start till tomorrow morning. So yeah, I just put it in there because I looked on the website to make sure. And yeah, Laura is a part of the Blue Tox uh, ecosystem. Uh, as Elise mentioned, obviously Elise is. Uh, Roslyn is, I think, speaking there. Roslyn Fung and Roslyn's part of the Blue Tox ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so is Kelly Falardo. So there's like four Blue Tox representing out of about eight speakers, I think. And so, so I'm cool with that because we have Blue Tox speakers over there on one side, and then we have Blue Tox speakers on this side. So tomorrow is a big day for the Blue Tox world. And I, yeah. I say that, I'm not saying anything's on there talking about Blue Tox. I just mean that a lot of the connections, which goes to the idea of online again, happen because of Blue Tox. Ex you know, because, Corey, like, I always said that you're a magnet for like the most amazing people. Oh, I, well, thank you. That's so generous. I won't, I mean, I'm going to say too. I have to say, so am I. So, I mean, like we're, so I'm not surprised because you are amazing. So I am a, amazing, an amazing magnet, but everybody that I've ever met through you um, on any of these events, anyone that you've referred to be on the flip your script Friday has always been like a kindred spirit. So I appreciate you so much. I appreciate the platform, you know, that we've been able to create virtually that you created. What would you call it? Like what's not virtual like real time i guess i don't even know what do you call what do you call a real stage these days <laughs> i guess it would still be live or real time i mean i, I, I mean this I, is real time too though so yeah live uh on a stage i guess we'll just say on a stage on a stage right um, so you've created a platform let's just put it that way a multi a multi-level platform um for people to be able to share their stories and inspire someone somewhere to be and recognize that they have an opportunity to love themselves in a life that they love and they can be the creator of that. Love it. So Elise, uh, one last thing before we let everybody go, because I know we went it over time, but again, we're still shorter than our normal time or right around Which the time. Is what, can you tell me that? Because I know the, the, day, the times are varied this week. Usually it's like from 11 to 3.15, but I think they're kind of like, what's, what's tomorrow's time? Well, I'm going to open it up so I have it exactly accurate. And while I'm saying this, I was going to uh, get you to tell people something, but also I would tell everybody, uh, I mentioned it once earlier, if you want to know more about Blue Talks, because I forget to say this a lot, uh, I'll put it in here. easyblutalks.com. Rather than me go, go here, go here, go here, just bluetalks.com is the best way to find those things. Tomorrow, what it looks like, we have four uh, speakers on tomorrow. We have that twice this week. Uh, so we start tomorrow at 11 Eastern. So 11 a.m. Eastern, and we go till 2.15 Eastern. So 11 okay. to 2.15. So I'm going to keep it easy, 11 to 2.30. And I think I gave you the, um, I call them the social media bites um, with the all four, but I'll post that so they'll see who's going to be, who we'll have as our special guest tomorrow and the times. Absolutely. That'll be a good thing to do. So the last thing I want to ask you, Elise, it's kind of timely because we're just hitting the top of the hour, so maybe this is our perfect time. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, because we don't often ask you this as well, but if people want to learn more about you, mm. where do you like EliseRothman.com Roth Elise is the best place. I am on social media. Uh, Facebook is Coach Elise. On Instagram, it's Flip Your Script with Elise. And I'm the founder of Flip Your, Flip Your Script Coaching. And Corey, I know you and I've gone back and forth about, you know, what do you do and how do you help people? And so I've been thinking a lot about that and mindset. And it really is about helping people with their mindset, but it's about helping them really consciously and intentionally create. And what is that? That's an architect. So as a mindset architect, I help people learn how to flip their um, internal script, like the linguistic way of thinking, right? And, and help them really recognize that that's the beginning point. People are like, it's yeah, but it's emotion and feeling and, and words, but everything starts with a thought if you think about it, right? And so it's helping people really recognize release and restore who they are as the star in their show. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna end with a little bit of little story of a client of mine who's quadriplegic, one of the most well beings that I know. He, um, was uh, he used to jump like do uh 
you know, when you jump out of a plane with a parachute skydiving, I guess, or something like that. And on his 25th hundredth jump, he was celebrating the day he became a chiropractor. And that jump landed him in the chair. Okay. And this was about seven or eight years ago, or maybe even longer. And I was coaching him. And one of the things he said to me was so profound. And I share this story because it applies to everyone right now is that he said to me, because, you know, the reason that I'm sitting here with you and I called you, you know, to help me work through and become the best version of me that I can become in the situation has nothing to do with me being in this chair. Everything that I've been challenged with and that I continue to be really, truly, deeply challenged with, I brought to this chair. Being in the chair, being quadriplegic, depending on people to wipe my ass, excuse my language, and feed me and all of these things, they pose another level of challenge. But what I'm struggling with, my inner value, my knowing, my self-worth has nothing to do with me being in this chair. And so I'm going to pose this question to everyone out there right now, whether you're watching live or you're watching the replay. Who are you in this chair? This global plot twist, this pandemic right now is your chair. Think about what you're challenged with right now. Think about the things that are coming to light that you are really having a hard time with. Forget about having to wear a mask or not wear a mask or test your child if he has the sniffles or not, or whatever these other things are, these external challenges that this pandemic has brought to light. But what are, and who are you right now? And I promise you, you brought all of this with you to your chair, the metaphorical chair. Okay. And it's a good place to start because it's an opportunity to see what's in your cup right? And figure out who you want to be and what would you rather have your cup full of and start clearing and letting go and creating space. And that's how I can help my clients. I help my clients recognize what's in their cup. I help my clients recognize that they're the star of their own show right now, no matter what the plot looks like, no matter what the scene is, you're always going to be the star. Some stars are heroes and they're always saving someone's life. And some people are, I mean, I'm talking about the movies or on TV and some people are stars and they're the victim. And so I can help people recognize who they are and recognize their true value and come back into alignment. There's nothing to fix. If you're having a hard time right now, you're just out of alignment with, like Maggie said, the version of you that you know you already are. I can help you get back there. I can help you recognize the value of who you are and become the star that you love in the show that you love and the scene that you love every single time. So I wanted to share that story because every time, every time I share it, it's a reminder to me as well that anything that's coming up for me right now has nothing to do with anything outside of myself. I brought it to the chair. It's so powerful that you said that because, and I'll, I'll just finish with this, but I, it, it brought it to my head. And, and like I said, I never, I never guess I used to, but I never second guess why the universe wanted me to share this part. But I had somebody reach out to me over the weekend. And again, I, this case, I won't say who the person was because okay. it might give me permission to say it. I never asked for permission, so I just won't say much more than to say they're struggling. And mm -hmm. this is somebody that's a, a high level achiever, like really high level achiever. And they're struggling right now because of some things that have been put in front of their path. Mm -hmm. And they sent me a message because um, I had sent them a copy of my book. And again, it goes back to that book I mentioned earlier, the book of why. And they said they were struggling with like maybe... I should even throw in the towel on the business. Like maybe this isn't the path for me. And they said they started reading in the book how I talked about, like I shared the stories of some of the people I've interviewed that were born with no arms and had these main major struggles. And to this day are still more highly successful than some people that weren't born with those disadvantages that we, that's what society calls them. And they said, I started realizing like, Every day they have a harder journey than I do. I mean, it's not that we're about comparing, but it's just like a point of reference to saying. But it is kind of, but go ahead. But I mean, but it's like, but it's it's a good comparison because they're saying it's a point of reference to say, you know what? Mm -hmm. And I always say it like this. Uh, Mark Goffney is one of the guys that I talked with that was born without arms. And there there's days, I'm telling you at least, it worked for me where I would wake up with a sore arm and I'd start getting in that funk mode. And then I'd say, wait a minute. You know how much Mark would give to have a sore arm? Right. And I asked him this, can I share that, Mark? Like, I didn't say, I want to talk about Mark without asking him. I said, can I share that, Mark? Because you inspire me because I start thinking, this guy wakes up with a smile on his face. And yet I'm waking up complaining about the pain in my arm, but I, I'm forgetting to be grateful that I have an arm to complain about. Mm -hmm. And so she said, reading those stories changed everything. And not only now is she said, am I all in? She said, I'm starting a second business because I'm that all in. And But the point right. of the story is to what you just said uh, about the idea of she might have felt that 
at first she wasn't taking the stuff to the chair. It was the world putting it in the chair. But mm-hmm. now by reading that, she said, she said, wait a minute, this is my own thoughts doing this now. I'm bringing it to the chair. But I can look at other people and say, wow, if they can do it, then why can't I make a reboot? And I just right. I just love that she shared that with me because, it, you know, again, it reminds us the power of seeing that we have a lot to be grateful for. Absolutely. And, and, but I also, this is really important too, if you're not feeling grateful and if you're feeling frustrated or sad or depressed and you're having a moment, allow yourself to have that moment because it's okay. And do not compare yourself to somebody with no arms or somebody in the chair, because how you feel is just as real and just as valuable as how somebody else feels, no matter what they're going through, because their perspective is their reality. So if your perspective is such, the question is, what is it between, because it's all between the ears right? It's all perception. And when that perception changes, then so does our life and how we feel and the reality in it. So, so yeah. So, and I do, I use EFT. EFT is my release tool. It's like dental floss for emotional plaque, dude. Are you kidding me? I'm like, you floss every day, you tap every day, you can tap into what it is, pull out those weeds and start recreating and re-scripting consciously and intentionally the life that you want to be the star in. And you want to love yourself as the star, right? Like you might as well, because what else are you going to do? Absolutely. What you're else are we going to do? <laughs> you know? I love it. Well, I mean, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I so appreciate you. I thank you as always. I salute you. We may or may not see you Same tomorrow. To you. If we don't, we'll see you Wednesday. So one Absolutely. way or another, we will see you at least back this week. Uh, so at least thank you so much. Thanks for telling people how they can connect with you further and a little bit more. I'll put it. I'll put my email, uh, my website in there too. Okay. Awesome stuff. And for everybody else, thank you as always for tuning in, giving us a purpose. Uh, I'll be here tomorrow. Same back uh, time, same back channel. I at least may or may not. Uh, so one way or another, Join us here tomorrow. Uh, we have Sue DeCaro to start things out. And I adore really her. Said, she was just on Flip Your Script Friday. She, talk about a kindred spirit. Tell her I said hi if I don't make it. <laughs> I will for sure, hundred percent. And as I least mentioned, she'll put up the um, the flyer to show you who's up tomorrow. So yes, thanks sure. everybody. I appreciate you as well. Let's call it a to be continued, and that to be continued uh, continues tomorrow. See you then. Or see Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs>